Welcome, welcome everyone. Hi there. We have our co-living communities there at the monastery and Mexico, Camas, and our friends from all around. There's Julie up there in Canada and and Jeffrey and Susanna and oh my gosh, what a full house we have tonight. Well, you won't be disappointed. You won't be disappointed tonight. We're going for another Grand Slam movie that goes all the way, takes your mind all the way back to the Kingdom of Heaven. None of this light stuff. This is a heavy hitter. This is a Babe Ruth of, uh, of movies, one of the all-time classics of spiritual awakening. And uh, it's pretty direct. I think, you know, it's like you really get to watch your mind on tonight's movie because we started off as we always do with our poll and our survey, our top two were uh, like holding back on communication. Um, that That's a downer. That'll keep you stuck in the matrix, holding back on communication. But, but we do. There's Eddie there, over there, that she was talking, Eddie was talking about the people pleasing and how thick it can be. Well, this is a good movie to kind of, Lucy, we already just had Lucy and Tron and <laughs> Eddie's like, oh my gosh, how much more can we go? But there's a, you, if you hold back on communication, you start to realize that that's your mechanism for awakening, that that prayer is the medium of miracles and prayer opens your heart up to allow you to communicate. And, and why is communication so important? It's because in time and space you need to teach what you would learn. And of course, ultimately we're talking about thoughts because that's your teaching and learning every moment of every day with your thoughts. But the mechanism of the body is used in a very specific way by Jesus and the Holy Spirit as a communication device. And the reason there is this huge fear of communication, of holding back in communications, it's because there is a very shaky identity that is feels like, the mask of the ego feels like it is it is weakened through communication. And Bill Thetford, who was one of the first two students, obviously of, in A Course in Miracles on the planet, um, Jesus sometimes would, would tell him through Helen that he was a professor afraid of professing. He was a teacher afraid of teaching. And so he made himself the head of the department at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center where Helen was and then he basically took on a lot of administrative tasks and he avoided the classroom because Jesus said you avoid the classroom because you're afraid of weakening yourself through communication. Actually, Bill Thetford believed that to teach was to weaken. And I see Eddie nodding because, you know, it seems like it's, it's safer to not communicate. It's safer to people please. It's safer to be agreeable. It's safer to say yes, 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 yes to everything. Uh, to be a yes man or a yes woman. And when we learn about what this uh, holding back of communication is basically because, as with Bill, he believed it weakened himself by teaching. He weakened himself. Also you could say that um, there's a fear of, of of not being liked, basically. Fear of rejection and not being liked. So a lot of times people say things like, mm, I, had to, I had to hold my tongue or I had to bite my lip. I was ready to say something but I, I bit my lip so I, so I couldn't say it because there's this fear of retribution, there's a fear of, of attack, there's a fear that the world, if if you would communicate what Jesus wants you to communicate, there is this deep fear in the mind that, that it will rain hell on your head <laughs> if you communicate what Jesus was communicating. And that's why it 
takes a, a lot of practice at, like the John Mayer song, say what you need to say, say what you need to say, or I think there's a Jackie Velasquez song about, um, about speaking, uh, letting Jesus speak for me, and, and also, um, don't let your heart go unspoken. That's a Jackie Velasquez song. So really, this movie is going to go right at that. Don't let your heart go unspoken. If you start to allow Jesus to activate your mind, you will find that things start coming out of your mouth, which is the very thing that you need to teach what you would learn, because it's loosening you from the, from the people-pleasing, it's loosening you from fear by allowing your body to be used as a communication device for Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you're actually being humble because you're, that's the only purpose that Jesus and the Holy Spirit have for the body, is just to let the voice for God speak through it. Jesus comes right out in the Course and says that, that the only purpose the body has is to let the voice for God speak through it. Those are some pretty strong words, considering the ego has made up thousands tens of thousands of purposes for the body. Go skiing, um, wine tasting, athletics, um, entertainment, sex, uh, goes on and on, you know, hobbies, interests. The ego has invented thousands and tens of thousands of purposes for the human body. And Jesus says, no, it only has one. It only has one. And if you want to wake up, you have to align with that one. Uh, you have to let the voice for God speak through it. That's all he wants. He wants you to use your, your body as a mouthpiece. And of course, our next online retreat is Beyond the Body. So, we need this movie if we're going to shift into fifth gear next, in, in August, to go into Beyond the Body. You really have to have a good run-up into Beyond the Body. I was saying, we, before we came here, Svava put on her uh, new album, and we just put it on shuffle so Jesus could pick, it. and we just were meditating for like 45 minutes, and then I'm like, oh my God, we gotta go. We got a movie tonight. And she said, I can't feel my body. And so, so she hobbled over here <laughs> to, to participate in the movie <laughs> and help her, help her down the stairs here, because, you know, that's the, that's the whole point, is to go so deep into harmony, unity in your mind, to get so deep into alignment that you lose awareness of the body. Sometimes you, I know uh, Helena, you were saying you had some really deep meditations, but oftentimes when people go into deep meditations, for a period of time they lose awareness of the body. Or, or even like Anne was having a walk recently and had a mystical experience, and you, it's so vast that you really do lose awareness of the body during those mystical experiences. So, so we're moving in that direction, so we're just allowing our mind to really get ready. Now the second category that in the poll came in, it was, um, it was looking for love outside. And so this movie really hits both of those topics really strong. Because not only is it, is it overcoming the, the fear of communication, but looking for love outside. The main character, Dan Millman, uh, basically th this movie tonight, Peaceful Warrior, is based on his book, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And Dan Millman, this is, this is really autobiographical. This is an account of his life where he goes, I think maybe it's University of Cal State Fullerton, something like that. It's a, it's a Southern Cal, uh, it's, a, it's a California university, and he's on, a, I think, a swimming um, swim team, maybe on scholarship, but, but he also has a wealthy uh, dad. So basically his dad's like, yeah, this is your college years, go and enjoy yourself. And you know, if you're on the swim team and you're a famous athlete at a university, um, he has girlfriends, lots of sex. Uh, he's basically seeking outside of himself uh, for his intimacy through the body. And that's, that's pretty common on planet Earth, you know, that's just, 
That's what we have done. That's how we went after it uh, through sexuality, trying to find love and intimacy through the body. That's, that's, that's like par for the course. That's the baseline on planet Earth. And, and then we have, as we get older, you know, the psychologists go, well, this is actually, it's, you think it's romantic, but it's actually codependent. Uh, you, you've got all this unconscious lack, and you don't believe you're loving or loved, and then you seek outside yourself. And Jesus t ramps it up a little bit in the Course, and he says, seek not outside yourself, for it will fail, and you will weep each time an idol falls. And believe me, when our relationships come to an end, there is some weeping that goes on. All of us know that. We can't deny there's, there's some heavy-duty grief at the end of a relationship because there's a sense of loss and there's, there's really, a, we could, if we're honest, we'll say there's great attachment um, to the love partner. And then Jesus is telling us, yeah, well, you, you've really fallen right into the ego's trap of special relationship and then you need, you need lots of mind training uh, to get out of that. Stephen Wiggs there, he's, every week you tell us a little bit about your adventures of escaping specialness. And tonight, we're going to see, this is cranking it up a little bit, because um, this is one of the rare movies too where we have a teacher figure coming in. Uh, you know, like the days in India, the gurus and the, the mighty teachers that, um, that kind of work so closely with the students that it, it unravels the ego in a faster way, in more of a dramatic, direct way. So, uh, this is like, this is like spiritual awakening on steroids. You know, this is, for you of, that are sitting there comfortably in the chairs and co-living, you're going to appreciate your mighty companions more than ever tonight, after you see this movie, Nick Nolde as Socrates, because Nick Nolde is, is going to interact with, with a man who seems to have a lot of pride, a lot of arrogance, who thinks he knows something, he thinks he knows a lot actually, and so we have the experienced teacher coming together with the proud and arrogant I know mind, and boom! <laughs> it's, it's, it's the beginning of more of a radical unraveling. So I think if in co-living you guys are going to be like, thank God I have my co-living mighty companions here. Oh my God, if Socrates was living in this house, I don't know what I would do. Benito would, might even run for the pool, uh, you know, with Socrates, because Benito would be like, hey, wait a minute, this is my house. And back in the old days, he did believe that. <laughs> now, it's, now he's more, he goes and sleeps in every room, you know. He's more into holy relationship now. He's not so much into the body, but he will go with a different sleeping partner every uh, 25 minutes in the morning. Depends on who opens their door. But uh, he's more into holy relationship because he's into sharing the love and communicating. He's not really into special partner, you know. He, he can move around the house pretty good there. So, this movie is really good, and I would have to say, as far as our survey goes, these are like two major, um, major categories. I mean, if you are successful in not holding back and really letting the Holy Spirit use your mouth and use your communications, use the body for communication, your spiritual awakening is going on the fast track. There is no doubt. You, you will not be into delay if you let the Holy Spirit speak through you, because you will be so authentic in all of your interactions that you will just tell it like it is, uh, as, as, a, as a being of light who's awakening to know their self as pure light. And, of course, we recently had uh, Lucy. Uh, yeah, there was uh, uncompromising in communication from a basically a a, a frightened, people-pleasing girlfriend to the light. How's that for us, from going from A to Z? And it's pretty similar to the movie tonight. We're going, this time instead of a female character, we're going with a male character, a swimming, uh, a really very good uh, skimmer, swimmer on the swim team, but he's basically starting off like Lucy did at, you know, uh, 
he's like in university in California, parties, maybe some drugs, lots of sex, um, lots of entertainment, um, you know, it's like where Dan Millman starts out, he's at I think Southern Cal Fullerton and he's like, uh, reminds me of the Bible, eat, drink and be merry for one day you shall die. That's a saying from the Bible, <laughs> eat, drink and be merry for one day you shall die. Somebody was saying online that I don't talk about the Bible enough. Well, there, there's a good quote from the Bible. And, and basically, Dan Millman is like, yeah, yeah. It's like the modern day USA version of that is party, 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 for one day we shall die. Uh, you know, let's, let's get partying and let's get busy with the partying. But it's really a lot of distraction. It's so much distraction and he's not aware of his unconscious mind. Enter Socrates, and Socrates will come into his life and basically, first of all, Socrates has to get his attention because he thinks he knows everything already and he's, he thinks he's, he's got the world on a string. You know, this is, Dan Millman at the beginning of this movie is like the Frank Sinatra song, I got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow, got the string around my fingers. What a world, what a life, I'm in love. You know, he, he's like doing the Frank Sinatra thing in college, like he's got a wealthy dad, he's got all the money he needs, he can party, he's got all the sex that he needs. He's, he thinks he's on top of the world, but really he's, he slips sliding away. He, he's twice removed from reality. He's got everything the world has to offer. And yet, he has an unconscious mind that has not been tapped into. He, he is sitting on a keg of dynamite, like everyone who comes to time and space. They're sitting on an unconscious keg of dynamite, and that dynamite can go off at any point. And when it does, you feel like you're just like, oh my God, why does the universe hate me? <laughs> it, it, the universe doesn't hate you, it's just that the unconscious mind is going to peek its head out and it's going to say, ah, I've got you uh, and, and you are under my wraps. So, the other great aspect of this is Socrates has a student. And the student's name is Joy. And this is a female character that, uh, that Dan Millman's going to fall for. He's, once he starts hanging around Socrates, he quickly loses attention on Socrates because there's Joy. Joy gets his attention. So Joy is like the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, you want to fall in love? Well, Joy's the one. Joy is your uh, twin flame. Joy is your awakening partner. Joy is the one that's going to take you out. And actually, that's what's so great about this autobiography is that in the end, after Socrates works the forgiveness lessons in a big time for him to, uh, to uncover and expose and release the ego, in the end, it's a great love story where the guy gets the girl in the end. Dan Millman ends up with Joy. He marries Joy, actually. He goes on after the movie to marry Joy. So, so he ends up with the holy relationship that's taking him, but he's got to go through major undoing before he can have a life of joy with Joy. But you see how this is our movie. That's what we want. That's what we're praying for, is a life of joy with Joy. How many of you have asked for your Holy Spirit, Holy Relationship partner, ask for joy to enter your life and say, uh, there's Esther, she's got her hand up. She says, yeah, you bring me joy. I, I have an idea of how joy might look in my life and I bring it on, Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus, don't hold back, send in joy. But in this movie, he's going to see joy pretty early on and his, his eyes are like, woo. He's right on her right away, and then, but she's so focused on her spiritual awakening that it, for her, for him to even go towards joy, he's going to have to go through 
huge forgiveness. He's going to have to let his upside down mind get turned right side up because he ain't even coming close to joy until he forgives the unconscious hurt and pain. And that's why this movie is such a great parable. It's actually showing us all the components of awakening, but in kind of an accelerated way. So just like with Lucy, you know, that's a ride. When we, when we watch Lucy together, you know, it's hold on to your hat. And this one's another one, hold on to your hat, because you're going you're gonna to see the ego rear up and it's, it's not going down easy. Uh, it's going to come up and then he'll distract away and then it's going to come up again and it's going to come up like a death wish, you know. It's going to come up in full strength to try to sabotage his mind to try to convince him that he, no way is he going to go for joy. And so he has to really, really hang in there with this uh, undoing of this unconscious mind. But in one sense, you know, this is the fast track. This, this kind of movie, if you really follow this movie, it can save you thousands of years. I mean, literally thousands of years of awakening. Because you don't have to play it out in reincarnation sense. You can get this in a mind sense. You can get the lesson from, just like from Lucy, you can learn a lot from Lucy. And from Dan, uh, you can learn a lot from, from Dan and Socrates and Joy. So this is like your holy trinity that's going to come zooming to your mind. Uh, instead of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, it's going to be Socrates, Joy, and Dan. <laughs> And, and Dan's going to really have to let go of a lot of Dan to get near Joy and Socrates. Because Dan is in the way big time. Dan is proud, you know, I'm great, I've got everything that I need, don't tell me what to do, you know, you know, excuses. That's one of my favorite scenes is, you know, when Socrates agrees to meet with Dan for the first time and then Dan's, he's caught up in something, typical ego distractions. And then when he gets to Socrates, he tries to throw a bunch of lies and excuses and game playing at Socrates. Not going to work. Not even close. You don't throw excuses and justifications at, at a teacher of God. Because it, a teacher of God will call you on it and say, no, actually that's, that is not honest. You are not speaking from spirit with all these justifications and, and, uh, and reasons. Well, I'd come to you, I'd come to know you soon, God, but there's some very important things uh, that I have to handle, take care of. And then you start to bring those to the light, and then the communications start pouring through you because you honestly want to transcend those fears and doubts. So, settle back and enjoy it. I will pop in during the movie, but this movie will not disappoint you. This is, this is not uh, Awakening 101. This is not awaken, Awakening Software Lite, L-I-T-E. This is some good, heavy-duty forgiveness. Uh, and it's even more fun in the comfort of your home, own home to watch this. Because you physically don't have to go through this. You've got Dan taking all the blows, the ego blows, for you. So you can sit there in the comfort of your home on your nice comfy chair and you can watch Dan take, uh, the ego take all the hits uh, during the retranslation process. Really it's not really hits, it's just the ego call, thinks of them as hits, but it's just the spirit is just retranslating the world. And there's no loss, there's no sacrifice, but it just seems like when you're identified with the ego, that's when it's the hardest. Because then you interpret every step that the Holy Spirit gives you as a sacrifice or as a demand. But the Holy Spirit never commands, the Holy Spirit never demands, and the Holy Spirit would rather you take the water slide down to the ocean just take that big long water slide, it's fast, it's quick, it's fun. Don't put your fingernails onto the plastic. Uh, just tuck those arms in and take a nice long water slide down to the ocean and then whoosh, into the ocean. And then you're there and you're back, like the Hillsong song, Oceans, you're back in the ocean. But 
Dan is going to show you how not to do it. Dan is going to save time by show you, he's going to show you the fingernails. He's going to get a lot of his fingernails broken. Uh, and they're all coming off. I think all ten of them are coming off in this movie. Uh, and this is why I say when you're on the water slide, do not put your fingers on the plastic. You tuck your fingers under your armpits. That's the safest place for them. You know, be very, there. Manuel's giving another thing. Just hold, close those fists and he's given the position. Manuel is showing the position like that. Just tuck, keep those, on. it's like a hug. Just think of the hug position. You're hugging yourself. That's, you've got those fingers in and you have those arms tucked under your neck and you're really ready for the water slide. But if you start digging those claws in to the plastic, then on a fast water slide, that is just not, not good. So enjoy the movie and I will pop in uh, during some of the, the prime scenes to uh, give you some insight. See you soon. That's a good point to pause. That's a good point to pause. Because the programming and the conditioning is when you come to time and space, when you come to this world, you have to work and strive and make something of yourself and carve out your niche and accumulate something and acquire something and learn something and Basically, it's a game of competition and striving and, and a whole programming on success. And once you invite the Holy Spirit in, and once you invite Jesus into your life, the dismantling will begin. And the key thing is, is as the dismantling is occurring, as your world as you know it starts to fall apart, as the things that you judged that were successful uh, start to uh, break down, fall apart. Um, as Jesus says, you know, you cannot judge your successes, your advances from your retreats. The mind, when it's so confused, when it's bought the bait of ego programming, it's completely backwards and upside down, and yet it thinks it's a functioning human being instead of watching a totally backwards and upside down world. It's, you actually believe, you understand what success is, you actually believe that there are people that are successful, that you could strive to be like them, you can attain things, you can achieve things, you can accumulate things, you can possess things, you can acquire things. And the problem is the mind doesn't realize that it's, it's totally deluded in everything. You know, that's why the, the biggest block to spiritual awakening is the I know mind. The I know mind that's bought the programming, that's bought the belief in success in terms of the world, that's bought the belief that you can be somebody, uh, or as they, they sometimes say, uh, you know, there was an old army jingle years ago in commercial when I was growing up, be all that you can be in the army. You know, and Socrates has already said uh, that if you really want to be all that you can be, it's going to take a lot of mind training. And really, he didn't really say what that mind training was, but it's, it's really a complete dismantling of everything that's been learned. I mean, about everything. It's a total dissolving and a dismantling of every single thing that has been learned about the world, about culture, about time, space, it's about, about the personality, identity that is believed to be real. So, this is kind of a crucial juncture because uh, as soon as he says, okay, I'll follow you, and he goes on, he stops having meats, stops with changes his, his diet, he, he changes, he says, okay, no sex, no uh, you know, he, he has a regiment that Socrates has given him and that's just an initial mind training regiment uh, for him to follow. And uh, his buddies are calling, oh, it's, he's eating rabbit food and they're making fun of his diet and, and his coach is saying, you know, you can, you go on the, the horse and, and you do that thing and then you can barely stand up, you know, 
next time you're, you're, you're tired, take a nap, don't come to practice. It seems like he's going through a bit of a dismantling of his identity. And what is really happening is that the goal of the present moment does not line up with any ego goals. And all the ego goals are based on learning from the past, past learning, and then projected into the future. So the goals to be qualifier and eventually make it into the Olympics to become a top athlete, you know, top gymnast, and all these goals uh, are not compatible with the present moment. And then there's one part in the Course in Miracles where Jesus says, you may have noticed that the goals that this course promotes are, are not in line with the goals that the ego has for you. If we were raised with a conditioning that says we should set goals and we should strive to achieve those goals, and that's part of the programming. That's the basic fundamental programming that's part of the human experience is you need to have goals, you need to have am future ambitions, and you need to strive to become something in the future. You need to strive to be successful, you need to strive to become competent uh, at various skills that you will need to navigate time and space. And the thing that's kind of shocking to the ego is the ego is promoting all these goals to avoid the holy instant, to avoid the present moment. Everything that's learned in this world is, is past learning. It's all designed to keep you from knowing who you are. Everything, without exception. It doesn't matter if whatever you think you know about the world, even in the most fundamental basic ways, you have to just have a little glimmering and inkling that that learning was designed to keep you from knowing who you are. That's the purpose for which the world was made. As Jesus says in, in the Course, the world was made in hatred. The world was made in hate. So this hate, why is the world made in hate? Well, it's because it's a distraction against from the present moment. It's a distraction away from be still and know that I am God. It's a distraction away from presence that Eckhart Tolle talks about. It's, it's a distraction away from the present moment. And so the goal of the Course is taking the mind in a completely opposite direction. You might say inward instead of focusing on externals and outcomes. I was saying that recently at, a, at the online retreat. I was saying, you know, in this world, um, it's, a, it's a world of outcomes. Everything. Even when parents are working with their children to potty train them. What do you think they're doing when they're potty training their children? Outcomes. They want the pee and the poop <laughs> in the pot. <laughs> that's, what, uh, that's what potty training is with children, right? There's an outcome. If the, if the pee ends up on the kitchen floor or the rug in the living room, even worse, <laughs> you know, it's, that's not the outcome that mommy wants. Uh, that's not the outcome that daddy wants. There's too many important things to be futzing around with cleaning the carpet and, the, and cleaning the kitchen floor when there shouldn't be those things on the floor because it's based on outcomes. And then, as you grow older and you go through education, why do you go through so much education? What's the point of all this education and specialization? I was talking to the group here about uh, Steve Jobs. Died at 56, one of the greatest inventors and genius minds and everything, and when he was laying on his deathbed, after having read uh, Yogananda's book, uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, every year, when he was on his deathbed, he's like, oh my gosh, you can't, none of the technology helps you face death. And, and this guy, Steve Jobs was Mr. Technology. All those iPhones, all these iPhones, iPads, that you're using, those iMacs and everything. He was Mr. Technology, but it didn't help him on his deathbed. He was absolutely helpless in his mind uh, to face death because he realized that his 56 years on earth did not prepare him for death. There was nothing of Apple 
There was nothing of Macintosh that he could take with him to face his belief in death. And Jesus, of course, tells us, you're not really afraid of dying, you're afraid of living. You're afraid, you're afraid of eternal life. Your, your real terror is redemption. You know, he's saying, you become so caught up in the ego's game of time and space, and now you're afraid of redemption. You're afraid of the present moment, is what Jesus is telling us. So Socrates is, is presenting a route into the present moment. And even when he has that little scenario, he takes him in where he's sitting up on the, the rafters and looking and reading everybody's thoughts, and that's scary uh, to Dan. You know, Dan, that's not something that most people are prepared for, is telepathy, reading people's minds. Even though when you look at the Gospels, Jesus, there's many scenes where he basically, like the woman who comes in and, and uh, puts oils and perfumes on his feet, and she uses his hair to wipe his feet, and then the Sadducees and Pharisees are all around thinking uh, he's exposing himself. Look, he's, he's uh, interacting with a sinner. He's interacting with a prostitute. And Jesus is reading all their thoughts. Like he knows their minds. He knows what they're thinking. He knows every single thought that's going on there. But he knows none of them are real. And that's what Socrates is, is teaching Dan. All those random thoughts, so-called, that you think, don't tell you who you are. They don't actually give you any glimpse of reality. All those thoughts of time and space are just a cocoon of falsity that's kept over the real thoughts in the mind. The thoughts you think with God. And what does Jesus say about the real thoughts? He says, when you get in touch with your real thoughts, you will soar into the light. You will soar to freedom because those real thoughts will take you directly to the kingdom of heaven. Those are the thoughts, and that's the instructions that you need to go toward the kingdom of heaven, which is your eternal nature. Now, I know we have our weekly meetings, and we have lots of online retreats and everything, and, uh, you know, it's, it seems to be, honestly, when you really look at the, the steps, like, the steps about learning to let the Holy Spirit and Jesus guide your your home life, your finances, your jobs, your careers, how you spend your day. Uh, there's, it's an unwinding process. That's, that's initially, in the preliminaries I'll call them, that's initially what this is about. We even have Helena and Jiska here, and they're, they're here in the, the gymnastics of undoing the mom concept, and they both have joined us tonight. But these are the preliminaries. There are, there are a lot more things to come. Just like for Dan, you know, Dan is, I know it maybe seems like, you know, you should get the gold medal if you do unwind from the mom concept, but I have to tell you, that's just the beginning. You're, if it was a football game, you're on the one yard line. All you have to do is got 99 yards to march, but you can't get to the one until you give up the mom. And, and you, think you're, you think you're ready to score. You're ready to go score a touchdown, to dive over the goal line. Like, holy Jesus, if I get over the mom concept, I should be able to dive in the end zone and get a score. And Jesus is like, no, that's, you're on the one. You know, you're, you're trying to get to the one yard line. Because that's what I'm talking about. It's the preliminaries. This stuff that seems to be the major stuff, it's not really major stuff. I mean... Francis and I have traveled around the world many, many times, and sometimes we'll be sitting with, sometime with a small group, and Francis starts to talk with her life, and I say, yeah, we're, we're all cruising along pretty good, until I say, well, Francis had a couple houses, she, get, she let them both go, and everyone was like, oh, what's this? Uh, she let go of her houses, and she had her, she had her own business, she let that go, oh, that, watch it there. Uh, and then, oh, she had a husband. She let, they let the husband go. Oh, you know, they start to get like sweaty as we're just, I'm just talking about the preliminaries. I'm still on the one yard line. We haven't even gone for, for to drive down the field. We're still talking to the one line, yard line. The people are sweating about the, the small stuff. And then there's a great line about don't sweat the small stuff because everything is small stuff. 
As you go on spiritual awakening, that's what you're going to start to realize. Everything that you thought was so dramatic and so important and so big and so valuable about this world was all upside down. That the belief in sacrifice in the mind, which was making false idols to take the place of God, had grown into a mountain. And you're thinking like, whoa, that's a big mountain. And Jesus is like, no, it actually isn't so big. Um, because because I, can, I can help you. At one point, Helen Schuckman had a vision where she was standing right next to Jesus and there was like this big, huge mountain in front of them. And she was just tilting her head back and looking up at this mountain going, shaking her head going, there's no way. Little Helen, no way. There's no way. And Jesus said, yeah, just take my hand and we'll go through it. We'll go through the mountain. He, he's like, you take my hand, we can walk right through it. It's not up over it. It's not a climb at all. When you take the hand of Jesus, you literally follow that guidance. You will feel like you are being carried through a mountain. And it could even be a mountain of granite. It doesn't matter to Jesus. Granite, rock, nothing. It's like he can poof right through anything. Because he knows the world isn't solid. It's just projections of images. There's no reality to the world at all. So this is why we're watching this movie tonight because you know, at this stage, what we've seen so far is, is Dan has just, he, Socrates got his attention by showing up on the roof of the Texaco station. You know, that, that, was, that grabbed his attention. How did he do it? I'm a gymnast. I know human beings can jump five, five feet in the air maximum, and that's like 10, 12 feet high. How did you do it? And then, uh, Right away, Socrates says, you like things explained. Like, he's into explanations. He's more in, tell me how you did it. You know, I'm a gymnast, I want to know how you got on that roof. And that curiosity piqued his, his interest and attention. And then the more he starts engaging, he, meet, he sees joy and he doesn't know, he's, he really likes the vibe of joy, but we haven't seen her much and he just, he also starts to see through various interactions with Socrates that there's something that he doesn't understand. And every time he thinks that it's something that involves the mind, Dan is calling it a trick. I like, oh, I did your trick. You know, I destroyed Trev, you know, on the, on the horse. You know, I, I destroyed him. You know, he, he's just still seeing everything through the ego filter of how can I gain how can this benefit me? How's this going to help my gymnastics? How's, going, how's this going to help my life? How's this going to help my future? And now, when his coach is saying, what's wrong with you? You're, you look tired. You, you, know, you can barely stand up. That's when the threat is to the ego. Because the ego will only go along with the spiritual journey if the ego thinks it can gain something from the spiritual journey. It's not going to go, go on this journey if it thinks it's going to be undone. You think the ego wants to be obliterated, wants to be poof, gone? You know, the ego is not going to go for that because the ego has just one demand, to exist. That's the one demand. And the spiritual journey is not going to go along with that one demand. It's going to actually go underneath it and wash and rinse away the very premise of separation that the ego is. So it's going to it's going to seem to disappear, even though it never really was there in the first place. It can't be a real loss. If something was just a hallucination, it can't be a real loss to lose something, lose or to not have something that you believed you had. You know, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. That's Janis Joplin. Uh, but actually, the ego is the belief in loss, and true freedom is, is seeing that there is no ego. That, that the, you never were an ego. You could never lose something because you never had what the ego offered, including the belief in the ego. So, we're at the key point right here, and I know many of you can relate to this because as soon as things start to fall apart, then this is where your mind starts to distrust Jesus. 
and you distrust God and you start to distrust the Holy Spirit, you think, oh no, now I'm starting to follow guidance and now the world's falling apart. Yeah, I'm going to go back to manifesting. I'm going to go back to uh, the secret. I'm going to get my dust off my secret book, uh, which says I can manifest a better world use the power of my mind. I'm, I'm going to put the, the course uh, in the garbage and grab out that secret book and start to use the power of my mind to, master, to manifest a better illusion. And Jesus is like, don't even think of it. You, you're not going to do this. You're not going to ever find a better illusion. What is false is false. And how could you ever be content being a holy child of God with falsity? You know, you have to go all the way with this. And that's pretty much what Socrates is, is telling Dan here, like, you know, you need to come to humbleness, you need to undo pride, you need to undo the I know mind, you need to uh, start to question these beliefs that you have about your self-concept. Now what's great about this movie is that this movie is a good example of how Socrates will use what Dan seems to believe in, which is his athletics and his athletic ability and his skills and abilities, because he knows that, that, the, that the athletic abilities and the ambitions that Dan seems to have for achieving and, and winning and so on and so forth is so central to his self-concept. And as I recently told somebody, uh, we were just talking, I was saying, Jesus would never have you go for the jugular. Don't go for the core defense. You always go to the minor defenses first before you go for it to unplug the ego entirely. If you go for the jugular, the ego will react and it will, you may find yourself just more locked into the illusion than ever because of the fear. It's too much fear that for the ego to believe everything. The whole tablecloth is going to get pulled off. So Socrates is going to work with the beliefs in the gymnast thing, with the beliefs in, in striving, but what will Socrates use the gymnastics for except for mind training? And that's what happens. Even when people come to spiritual community, we've got a whole community here and, and the co-living communities are all there. The Basically, the, the Holy Spirit and Jesus will use the skills and abilities that you seem to have developed in an ego framework, will use them to channelize them towards toward the light. So, like in my case, you know, I was in university for 10 years and then the course came after those 10 years of university, so I developed some vocabulary, I developed some knowledge and awareness of how things work in the world, and so on and so forth, and then the phase that came after 10 years of university was a major undoing and dismantling of the self-concept, but using the skills and abilities that I had that would be helpful. What does it mean by helpful? Well, like I said in the beginning, to let the voice for God speak through the body. That's, that's all that Jesus sees as helpful. And I'll say, say, smile through the body, laugh through the body. Actually, back in the pre-pandemic days, we were actually were hugging. I actually hugged people like Ama. I mean, all over the world, in 44 countries, I got to hug thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people back in the pre-pandemic days. You know, now it's social distance, five feet, you know. But, you know, you got to be able to, now you still have a voice, even with social distancing. Jesus is like, now I really need your mouth. <laughs> I can't. I can't do as many hugs uh, in the current uh, climate as I used to back in the good old days. So you have, to, you have to use the mouth. So be ready for your spouses, for your friends, for your children, for your neighbors. Be ready to have that voice of Jesus coming through there. Because if, if you've got a social distance, you know, he's really going to use that mouth now. And he's going to use your mouth to smile a lot and to laugh a lot. He'll use your face as the laughing You'll be like the laughing Buddha, the laughing Jesus, because he's going to use what's available. In the he's not going to be stretching, he's not going to break the Caesar's laws. You know, he said it two thousand years ago: "Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's." If Caesar says social distancing, then social distance. But let that voice come through, and let the smile and the sparkly eyes come through. 
This character, David, I've been down here. I went out for a dental appointment. Was that yesterday? Yesterday morning. For the first time in three and a half months, I went on the main road. I've been, the ego says, you're under house arrest. I'm like, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm doing, I had a video call with, uh, with different ones. I, and uh, Helena sent me a couple videos today sharing what's going on. I'm having a fun time here because I'm, I'm into my function. My function doesn't require bodies traveling around the world. I did that for 30 years, so it's like, you know, it's like enough of that. For now, at least, you know, I, I did a little road trip today down to Ahi <laughs> Hik. But, but you see, you just go with the joy. You go with the joy and you, you, you go and let the Spirit use your body for the purpose that's intended. And, and for Dan, at this stage of the movie, he's basically, he thinks that Socrates is ruining his life, you know. He basically had a little bit of trust, he gave it to Socrates, he started to follow Socrates, but now as soon as his gymnastics are suffering, so to speak, as soon as his coach is getting critical, and he said, I think my coach probably thinks I'm on drugs, you see, He's concerned about that self-concept. And he's ready to abandon Socrates at the beginning. He's not on the one yard line yet. He's not even close to the one yard. He's on the one inch yard line. <laughs> one, he's, he's just barely off of the goal line. He hasn't even come close to the one yard line. And he's already, oh, this is too hard. This is too much. It's going to hurt my athletic career. You know, he's ready to abandon the spirit at the one inch mark, you know, already. He's back there with the snails, you know, just, just barely off the goal line. So, we're going to go forward here and then you're going to start to see that the Spirit will speed things up for him, but the Spirit will use contrast experiences and the Spirit will use, really get, get his attention again because he has to start to realize that what he believes is valuable is actually valueless. And what he doubts is even possible, is not only possible, but it's, it's, it's certain. It's, there's no way to not know who you are. And it doesn't matter where you seem to be in terms of your progression, you will never be able to truly value this world because God didn't create it. And, and what God creates is valuable. That's, the eternal is valuable. In fact, you know, sometimes people who are into like the new age and, and manifesting and everything, they like to really fling around that co-creator word. You're a co-creator with God and you can create whatever you want. No, 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 that's not the meaning of co-creation. Co-creation is in spirit. And what Jesus is saying is, you as the Christ have creations, but they're spiritual creations and, they, and they're waiting for you to remember who you are so you can know what they are. These are not babies. These are not things of this world. These are not art pieces and sculptures and, and paintings and songs and everything. These are eternal creations that are literally children of the Christ in spirit. And they're waiting for the Christ to be the Christ. They're waiting for the sleeping mind to wake up so that these creations can know their spirit parent, which is the Christ. So God creates in spirit, Christ creates in spirit, and then Christ has creations that are purely spiritual. That's what co-creation is about. It's all on the spiritual realm. It has nothing to do with images. It has nothing to do with time and space. It's all purely spiritual. And that's the reason why we have to keep the faith because when we're just going through the preliminary steps, we're not close to knowing those creations. And we're not really close to knowing God or knowing who we are. We're, we're still mired in what seems to be layers of false belief and complexity. But the reason I'm bringing this up at this point is because I really am encouraging everybody to really be attentive to the instructions of the Holy Spirit because at this beginning, even though they're the preliminaries, they have to come before what's coming next. And you can't really get into what's coming next until you go through the preliminaries. And Dan is right now, he's ready to, to dump Socrates before reaching the preliminaries. And, and that's 
I'm just giving this whole context because that's what we're all looking at right now. Okay, let's go back and see what Dan is up to here. So, coach tells him you will never compete again. And, and yet, at this point, you know, the ego made the body for one thing, competition. And so the ego doesn't even like this, you will never compete again, because the body was made to compete. Uh, the body was, and, and think about it, if you look at your life, why all the education, why the jobs, why when you're dating somebody, are you trying to woo somebody, to land somebody, to win somebody, to, to I mean it's in every aspect of time and space is competition. And at this point, his whole life has been based on competition and striving to be the, in, in the Olympics as a, um, as a gymnast. So, even to hear that from his coach, you know, I've talked to your doctors, you know, it's over. You will never compete again. And then, even that, um, when, when the mind hears that, when the ego hears that, it, it doesn't know what it wants, but it's, it's definitely made, it made the body for competition. That's one of the things that the ego made the body in hate for, made the world in hate for, was competition, among other things, among many other things. To seek and never find, to, to choose among the dust and try to find salvation and happiness and, you know, uh, I think about the United States of America and the, comp the, the uh, Constitution, uh, it says that you, you are entitled to the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, it doesn't say anything about the, the awareness of happiness, but the pursuit of it <laughs> in time and space is part of the United States Constitution. It's the pursuit of something where it can never be found. But the ego doesn't want you to know that. So the ego says, strive, compete, win, succeed, you know, accumulate, possess, all these things are part of the great lie. The whole grand illusion is based on seeking among the illusions, seeking outside yourself, when inside yourself is pure light and outside yourself is, is a cosmos of images. And even in the Matrix, you know, in, the, in Matrix 2 when he gets to the architect, the door to the right leads back to the source, the door to your left leads back to Trinity in the Matrix. He goes for the door to the left and he finds himself unconscious, knocked out by the sentinels. You know, it's this, even the Matrix is teaching us the same thing. You know, you are the one, but if you pursue something in time and space and you try to go for an outcome, you will lose, you will stay asleep. You know, you will not know who you are as long as you're into outcomes. And and what does the ego say, in order to pursue the outcomes, what do you need? An income. <laughs> you need an income to pursue the outcomes. And Jesus is like saying, no, trust me, I'll show you divine providence. I'll use the symbols in a way that loosens your mind from the ego belief and takes you inward to the kingdom of heaven, to the light, beneath all of these meaningless thoughts and the meaningless world that these thoughts really represent. So, so we're at the point right now where, the, there's the contrast experience, you know, the doctor says, you didn't just break your leg, you shattered it in 17 pieces. And basically they put in this steel rod to hold the leg together. And he's just still on crutches and so on and so forth. But this, this scene coming up right now is, is actually the scene where the ego reacts to being told, you will never compete again. There, this is a scene that's showing how strongly the ego does not want you to give up that belief. 
What's the contrast? I remember there was one point years ago where I remember Jesus clearly saying in my mind, you will never compete again. It was the most glorious voice I'd ever heard. And I have to tell you, when you, when you actually embrace that, you will never compete again, you're going to be so happy that you won't know what this world even means. You're going to reach heights of happiness when you hear Jesus tell you the same thing. You will never compete again. In fact, in The Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you know, beware of the belief in competition. You know, you, you have to be vigilant, he says in the Course, you have to be vigilant against the idea of competition. Jesus is telling our mind, you will never compete again. And the ego is like, hell, hell yes, hell yes will I compete again. I will compete any way I can. And, and that's of course, because that's what the ego is. It is a belief in competition. A belief in separation from God is to not know who you are and to believe that competition is possible. But what do you need? You need two to compete. And Jesus is saying, there's only one. There's only one. It's impossible. That's why you will never compete again, because, because you can't compete in reality. There's only one spirit. There's only one life. There's only one love. It takes two to compete. So this is going to be not only a, an ego reaction to the belief, to the, to the being told you will never compete again, which seems to be an obstruction of a future goal, but actually then he's going to go up the clock tower. Now the clock tower, why do we love the clock tower scenes? Why do we love the clock tower scenes? Because what is the one belief in our mind that has that is our death wish, that has driven us crazy. What is the one belief that, that is representative of the ego? It's time. We've heard the clock tower ring a couple times already in this movie. It's, it's foreshadowing. It's telling us, listen, in the end, if you're not going to compete, if you're going to really go for salvation and enlightenment and self-realization, you're going to have to let go of the belief in time. Now that's when we start to get past the preliminaries. When you start to get so focused in your function, however that looks, however the Spirit has you in your special function, when you lose track of time, that's when you're, you're getting past the preliminaries. And we've all had those experiences when we just are so happy that we, we lose track of time. Even as children, we, we did it when we were playing. Sometimes in the summer, you know, no school, no, no bells ringing, no, no books to study, no exams to pass. We're just out there playing in the sunshine and we're happy as can be and we lose track of time. Uh, now this clock tower scene is, is very much indicative of, of the ego belief because the ego doesn't want you to question time. It, it, you know, it'll say, well, you go ahead and you can question a few things and everything, but that's okay. But don't question that it, the belief that it takes time to be who you already are. You see, that's getting really close to the core of, of salvation. That's getting really close to the atonement when you start to question the belief in time. And think about how when you're thinking during the day about how much time do I have today, what are all the things I have to do? Will I have enough time? Uh, how much time will it take before I'm enlightened? How much time will it take to pay off my debts or to achieve something or accomplish something? How much time will it take to unwind from the ego? Time, 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 time. You know, it's, you, as Socrates would say, you need to ask better questions. You, you, those questions are not helpful. None of those questions that I just said are, are helpful. They don't really help at all. To be concerned and worried about time is to reinforce the belief in it. You know, just reinforce that it's a reality, and it's not. It is. So really the question comes down to um, what is your purpose? I mean, I did a, a counseling call today and 
And the friend I was talking to uh, from Canada, her life is starting to fall apart and with her, her mother with dementia and she's been dealing with so many things seemingly, which are the, just the preliminaries and then she's almost 41 years old and then she said, I need to, I need to talk, I need help. I need help David, now I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. I'm almost 41 years old and I'm pregnant. And, and then she got angry at herself, how could I let this happen? I have two children already, two young children, and how could I allow this to happen? She was beating herself up for, for getting pregnant, like really upset with herself. And again, I had to join with her in, in the counseling call and say, wait a minute, hold it, you can't, you can't go back and change the script. You can't change the script, it's pointless to ask, how could I allow myself to get pregnant? Now, the question is, what is the guidance right now, and what is the purpose right now? Let's join in the purpose. You have a holy purpose. You're being called by God. It doesn't matter where, how you perceive the script is going, if, if, if you believe you've just found out you're pregnant, and now you're starting to, to doubt your actions, and doubt your decisions, that's just falling back into the ego trap again. You need to join me in this purpose because you have such a profound purpose that this purpose will literally take you beyond time and space, take you back to eternity. So we need to join right now in the purpose. That's what the prayer is. What is the most purposeful use of time? Because that will determine your decision. She had already made an appointment at an abortion clinic, but also, she had two huge guilt, huge guilt, uh, you know, looking at the options and looking at, wow, I don't like either option, I need help. Yeah, that's good, yeah, purpose. Purpose is the only choice. That's, that's the thing that's going to lift us up. It always lifts us up, is the purpose. What is my purpose? What is it for? What is this pregnancy for? What is this relationship for? What is this... TV movie gathering that we're doing, what is it for? What is the purpose? The purpose is so important that if you can start to zoom into your purpose, that purpose will unwind you very rapidly from time and space, very rapidly from the ego. If you just zoom in on your purpose, you'll realize that the purpose is for you to be a miracle worker and to collapse time and space and bring the Alpha and the Omega together so that in the end you come to that point where you can say like Jesus, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You can bring it all together in the holy instant. But that's the purpose for everything, is to, is to allow the miracle to collapse time and show you that you are literally the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The, the, that past and future are not separate. Um, they're, they're actually Time is simultaneous, it's not even linear. But you need a lot of miracles to take you into that experience of uh, that everything is simultaneous. It's gonna, you have to really be practical about that. So, these next scenes are fantastic because we've all been there. We Dan's going down that dark road of despair, disillusion, anger, frustration. We've all been there. We all have been there and we all will know that we need to rise up from that anger, that that despair and anger is not our, is not our destiny. So let's, uh, let's watch Dan go through this. Isn't it great? You can just sit there in the comfort of your own home and say, uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, uh, I, I don't really need to go through such extremes. <laughs> I, I would rather be a willing learner, a happy learner, than uh, go through some of this uh, intense, Darkness, you know, this dark night stuff. Okay, that scene is very much like if you watch Revolver, the movie Revolver, the elevator scene. You know, you're nothing without me. The ego, the ego basically has generated a dependency where by believing in the ego, you know, you're believing in death. And and the only way to be free and to know who you are in reality is to let go of what you believe you are. 
And the ego is going to do everything it can to persuade you that you need it. You know, like, like the elevator scene uh, in, in Revolver, you're nothing without me, you're nothing without me. Who are these new friends? You know, you know the ego doesn't even like mighty companions. It's like, no, you, it wants old friends. We're old friends. I've been guiding you from the beginning. Even in the Truman Show, some of you might remember when he's, he's ready to go through the exit door and leave the Truman Show, the ego, Christoph, is saying, you know, Truman, you know, you're, you're nothing without, without this show. You know, there's nothing out there, is basically what the ego says, when he's ready to go through the exit door and leave the Truman Show, the ego screams, there's nothing out there. So, the ego is, is only something when you believe in it, and it, as long as you give your mind's belief to it, it will fight with everything that it seems to have, using the power of the mind to keep you from escaping from this world. That's why self-realization, self-actualization seems to be something that you have to carefully and with great patience and great devotion, you have to go into. This, this enlightenment is something, isn't something that you can just say, well, I'll give you a, an hour or two each day, Jesus. You know, Jesus is like, an hour or two? <laughs> Out of 24, this is what you're, you're offering? Do you know that, that you have to expose the entire ego unconscious belief system and you're you're going to give me an hour, hour or two a day. It may start out that way. Of course it starts out five minutes, two minutes, one minute. It has to start somewhere. It's great, whatever you start with, but it takes a devotion to question everything. Like Jesus says, to learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden, or it will obscure and jeopardize your learning. In other words, you won't reach atonement without the willingness to just question everything. And, and really, it's just saying when you get upset, whatever that upset seems to be, just be willing to question your perception. Be willing to question what you believe. Because whatever you perceive, if you perceive a problem, if you're upset, there's still an unconscious belief that has not been raised to the light. So that's just one more opportunity to raise it to the light. So this is actually, I think right now, this scene right here is first the anger and smashing up all the trophies and smashing the degree that's under glass and smashing everything up is, is one of great disillusionment. And, I, and we all know that that's part of the spiritual journey, going through a seemingly a disillusionment phase where you feel so broken down, you feel so much despair, like I've failed, I have not achieved what I wanted to do here in time and space. And actually there's a dis disillusionment period, bewilderment, disorientation, confusion. Jesus, he tells us all of it. He's, he's preparing us to just move through these shadows and keep moving through. And then when he basically says up on the tower there, you're the one I have to let go of, he's actually coming to a recognition in that scene that he has to let go of the ego. That the ego is where the fear is coming. And that's it's a beautiful realization when you realize that. That's why you're studying A Course in Miracles. That's why you're at these movie gatherings, because you've already had the recognition I have to let go of this ego. Or as the, the famous waffle commercial that I grew up with, let go my ego. I like, I always used to, I'd be a little kid watching a round waffle commercial, egos were these round waffles, and then the one little boy says, let go my ego, with a southern accent, and I'm like, oh, there's wisdom, there's wisdom in that, let go my ego. So that's what's happened to him now, he's on the tower, and he's, he's got to let go my ego. He's got to let go of that ego. And even though that's just a vision and everyone goes, ooh, it's spooky and it's dark and ooh, it's spooky, spooky up there on the top of the clock tower. For all of us, this is like, it's very symbolic. Uh, we, we, are, we stand on the clock tower of time and space. 
This we stand on the whole world which is built on on time and now we've come to the realization we have to let go of the ego. And we're going to need some mind training for that. We're not going to try to fool ourselves that we're just going to twinkle our our nose like on Bewitched or we're going to click our our little ruby slippers like in the Wizard of Oz, you know, and go, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. Click your little sandals. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, you, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work, you know. You have to be willing to, to give yourself over to the mind training. And again, this unwinding from things that seem to be important, like symbols of the world, that's just preliminary. We're still in the one yard line, you know. There's so much mind training to go that if you really knew how much mind training is to go, you wouldn't dilly dally too long on the one yard line. You know, you wouldn't make, you wouldn't turn the one yard line into like a 40 year dramatic, oh, woe is me, Jesus is having me sacrifice all the good things in life. Oh, woe is me. Mikopa, Mikopa, oh my God, I could, and, you're, and you, if you knew you were just on the one yard line, you would laugh, you would just go, oh come on, get over it, get, get driving down that field, come on, let's get to the two yard line. There's a lot of ways to go, I'm not going to waste 40 years with the, with the first yard or two, you know, it's, it's not the best use of time actually. So now, here we start to see things really pick up in the movie, because this, once you decide you really need to let go of the ego, your mind is so powerful that there's nothing that can stop you actually from letting go of the ego. Now all the angels, everything in time and space leans toward you. Everything comes to you that you need. Everything will now accelerate because that you've made a fundamental decision in your mind that you would be better off without the ego. <laughs> you know. You were better, you'd be better off if you were wrong about all of time and space and you were right about the Christ. You would be better off, I did an audio years ago, better off if I was wrong. And that's from the, the uh, Rules for Decision section. At one point in the Rules for Decision, you actually realize you'd be better off if you were wrong. I always liked that, that phrase, you know. Because isn't that, that's like in 12 steps when you, have, you admit you have a problem. And then all the healing begins in 12-step programs as soon as the admission comes in that the life as you know it, your alcoholism, your addiction, is you can't manage it. And, and you're hoping that you're wrong about the addiction and you're hoping that there's a higher power to lift you up and to take you back into to sanity from, from the brink of insanity. You're hoping you can come back to sanity. So now let's get ready because uh, he's going to start uh, clicking in with the program. And, uh, and of course we know that'll be symbolic of welcoming Socrates back. You know, like Rumi says, even if you've broken your vows a thousand times, come, yet come again. He's got to come yet again to Socrates because Socrates hasn't left him. He just, he just left Socrates which was that pride thing, you know, I could do it on my own and get out of my way silly man, get out of my life silly man. You know, at some point we do turn back to the Holy Spirit and go, well, okay, I'm sorry, I've been, I've been off carousing in time and space a bit here, but I, here I am, I'm, I tried it on my own, but deep inside I've known I'd be back to set things straight. Peter Cetera, share, good song. Okay, let's go. Now this is an example of the lessons where he, he sees the guys coming up and, and they said, give us your money and everything, and he's like, you picked the wrong guy the, to mess with, um, a little leverage at the right time. You see, the ego will use the past learning to try to determine what the lessons are. But the ego can't determine what the lessons are. So every lesson is a lesson in letting go of thinking you know, even the idea of better or worse than, you know, that they were just doing in the, in the bar. And now they come right out after Dan throws up, uh, the next lesson comes very quickly and again, 
you know, it's not a lesson of of gaining some kind of skill or ability and even the lesson of the leverage at the right time and the right application is all pointing to what Jesus calls, in my defenselessness my safety lies, the meek shall inherit the earth. If I defend myself, I am attacked. The best defense is no defense. <laughs> because if you defend, you must believe that there's something that needs defending. And the spirit doesn't need defending. That's why Jesus was always saying things like, if somebody smite you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Because he understood the greatest law, the greatest lesson of all is that if you try to protect something or you try to defend something, you reinforce that which you're protecting or defending, which is the ego. And, you, and he's already come to the point where he wants to let go of the ego, not to reinforce it. So this lesson will just be presented over and over and over and over until you have this experience where you have this recognition, oh my gosh, I've got, I've got nothing to defend. Nothing at all, ever. I never had anything to defend. I remember uh, years ago, uh, somebody, I think a student of mine was talking to me and they go, well we have to be practical. I said, yeah, we have to be practical. And they said, what about human rights? You know, we have, we have human rights, it's, it's even in the Constitution, we hold these rights to be self-evident. Life, liberty, the suit of happiness. And I said, no, actually, you even have to question human rights. You have to question there's a belief in something called human rights. Because everything that you believe you have a right to as a person or a body or an individual is still part of an of a elaborate defense mechanism to keep you from knowing who you are. You might say that you, you were created in perfection and so you are entitled to miracles. That's, that's like a logical statement. I was created in divinity and therefore even in terms of time and space I am entitled to miracles because miracles collapse the belief and re help me remember who I am. So I'm entitled to miracles. And it's good when you can say I am entitled to miracles but it doesn't help you when you think you're entitled to anything else. I'm entitled to money. I'm entitled to be respected by other people. I'm entitled to have my Facebook posts respected and, and not disrespected by, <laughs> by uh, comments. No, you're, you're not entitled to, to likes and loves and to good comments on your Facebook post. Actually, it's, it's helpful when you start to realize that you're not really entitled at all to anything of time and space, but you are entitled to miracles. And a miracle is just another way of looking at the world. It's just seeing the false as false. It, and when you really follow Jesus, you start to realize it cannot be that difficult to see the false as false. I mean, it has to be easier than trying to pretend that you're right about something in time and space. That you're trying to be right about some human personal right. Uh, because in the end you start to realize that the ego set all that up just so that you wouldn't come to the realization of just see the false as false. So that's really what forgiveness is, plain and simple. But you can see even in this scene right now, um, Dan is thinking like, oh you don't want to mess with uh, Socrates because he remembers the maneuvers of, of Socrates and the leverage things. But those, that, that wasn't the lesson. Martial arts are not the lesson that the Spirit is trying to teach. Def being able to defend yourself with great skill and ability is not the lesson it's the lesson is in defenselessness. The, the lesson is in meekness. And I've had many, many opportunities throughout my seeming 
experience as a time and space to practice defenselessness, you know, it's so wonderful. It works every time when you when you have that remembrance of I don't need to defend, I don't need to protect, uh, I don't need to get into any kind of protectionism because that will just bind me to a false belief and I'm trying to let go of that, that false belief called ego. I don't want to be bound to it by, by my mind's energy be given to it. So let's see how, uh, how Socrates uh, shows defenselessness uh, in this situation where the three guys have come up and, and they said, uh, give me your money. And Socrates right away throws the wallet to uh, the three guys, you know. That's a, the first act of defenselessness, but let's see how it goes from here. Okay, key point here. As you begin the mind training, the Holy Spirit will use the skills and abilities that you have already made in an ego framework. And so this is an important point of starting to realize that that in order to really start to move with the mind training, you, you have to be careful not to try to push anything away or, or affirm and, and try to speak things that you, you wish were so, because that still is self-deception. If, if you start to label and dismiss things, which happens on the spiritual journey, you know, oh, well, well I'm not going to, that's already went through the thing with the drinking and the cigar, like, there's no better or worse in form, it's what will increase the helpfulness. And initially, with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will use what the ego made, so your skills and abilities are, are channelized in a way that starts the mind training process. You see, it's, he's not, He's not telling Dan to, to give up what is, has been his entire life. At the beginning phases of mind training, that would be going for the jugular. That, that is not how the Holy Spirit and Jesus work. It's just taking the skills and abilities and then letting them be used as part of a mind training. It's like getting your mind in the right direction. And so, basically Socrates has said, now, now we begin the work. In other words, this is the beginning stages of, of the mind training. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to go searching for new techniques, new formulas, new ways. It's like, it's like you just are saying to the Holy Spirit, here is the world that I've projected. Now I want you to take that and use that and send me in the right direction. So it is a bit of a turnaround, but you can see how he's, he's not dismissing the, uh, the gymnastics, because his whole life has been gymnastics, as well as a lot of other things which are quite distracting. But it's like the first thing the Holy Spirit is doing is he's picking the gymnastics to begin the rehabilitation of the mind, not really the body. He's even told him, a warrior does not depend, look for victory. He said over and over, it's not about the future. So, clearly this is a mind training exercise at coming to be more present. That's what this is all about. He's not really trying to retrain, retrain muscles and, and ligaments. He's not trying to retrain the body. It's, it's allowing the body to be used in whatever way the Spirit guides as far as the redirection of, of those skills and abilities. It reminds me of the time when, you know, he was sitting in despair with his back leaning up against the tree and Joy comes and sits with him and says, ask him how it's going and she talks to him a little bit and then she reaches out and it looks like she's doing a little Reiki there with his heart, and he's saying, it's my leg, shouldn't you be doing that to my leg? And she says, somehow I think that's, your leg is not the only thing that's broken. She's 
going right addressing his despair, his his disillusionment. She's she's going right to the heart, to the heart of the matter. And that's the way the spirit works. It works with the heart of the matter. It knows that we have tremendous fear of love, tremendous feelings of unworthiness, tremendous uh, self-doubt. And that's where sometimes things will happen in which you start to gain little slivers of some confidence, some a little bit of confidence, and you still may project it out to the body. You may, still may uh, you know, you still may seem to do things where you seem to gain a little more uh, confidence. Ultimately, the spirit is just using the skills and abilities to turn it around to start to wash away these deep feelings of unworthiness. I'm thinking of uh, the title of, uh, of a Henry Jagler movie that I used to watch years and years ago, Can She Bake a Cherry Pie? That's the name of the movie, Can She Bake a Cherry Pie? Imagine that you've had many unsuccessful attempts at a cherry pie. You know, the cherry splatters all over the, the oven, um, it's all cracked, it, you, you try to get it out of there and it falls into all these pieces and you quickly, you shuffle it together, you say, you say to your partner, oh, it's, it's cherry cobbler. No, it's not. It's, it's a terrible cherry pie. You, you have made a terrible cherry pie. You can't even cut it to serve it because you, you cannot bake a cherry pie. And so, the Holy Spirit has works with you so you can make a cherry pie. You see? That's how it starts. You know, can she bake a cherry pie? You, you actually could, could learn to make a good cherry pie where, where it's, you come, you get it out of the oven, doesn't have a crack and red stuff oozing all over the place. And then you let it cool and you take your knife and you slice it up, a little cherry pie a la mode, you, you serve it up and you've done it. You've, you've accomplished the cherry pie. This is how the Holy Spirit has to work. Little advances. Because, why? Because the mind is, feels so unworthy. It, it's so turned away from the light and it's so been involved in this personality self that it needs to build up some, a little bit of confidence. And then as you go along and you start to build that confidence up, then the Spirit can redirect it to more and more focused projects as you go along. And amazing, miraculous things can happen. I mean, we were just listening to the Svava's uh, album on, on uh, Shuffle, and I was saying, Svava's like, oh, I was losing track of the body. It's, the, it's gone from songs to recorded songs, to songs on an iPhone shuffling, to meditation where it's being used as a music meditation, and then the losing awareness of the body, the spirit's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, it's more than an album. Uh, it's got, it a, has a mind training capacity to now, instead of just listening to the volume and all the things to try to get it to be a professionally produced album, the spirit's like, yeah, here, listen to it and then relax, and then you go into deeper, deeper states of mind. And that's how it goes with everything. You know, even your mind-watching experiences with movies can get more and more heightened, or listening to music, or meditating, or being done through. Maybe you, you start to uh, channel and speak, uh, you know, maybe you start doing satsangs. Maybe you thought, I'll, I'll never do a satsang. No, I'm never going to do a satsang. And then one day, it's like, oh my gosh, it's a satsang. You know, it just kind of pops out of you, you know. It's like, wow, look at this. I'm being done through and it's a satsang. You know, it, it, it comes a bit as a surprise to you. You just never know what's going to happen. But this is slowly how the Holy Spirit is building the confidence, turning you towards the Christ nature that you are. And, and literally taking you more and more closer to the, like the beyond the body experience where you can be so done through and so aligned with spirit that you start to pay less and less attention to time. And you pay less and less attention to the body, which is a product of time. You know, Jesus says that no single instant does the body exist at all. It's always remembered or anticipated. Or you might remember from the Lucy movie, you know, when she's toward the end of the movie, the professor, Morgan Freeman, the professor, he doesn't understand 
what's going on? Like, how can everything be energy and how can everything be light? And she says, she just shows, shows a car moving across the screen and she said, if you speed it up fast enough, faster and faster and faster, Lucy shows him that the car will disappear when you speed it up fast enough. It's, it's, it goes into such a high velocity that, that the, that the per human eye cannot perceive it. And that's kind of like it goes with your mind. The more you go into higher and higher vibrations, or let's call it higher and higher function of the Holy Spirit, your vibrations in your mind speed up faster and faster and faster and faster and faster until you get maybe a mystical experience, we'll say, where you glimpse a, a light episode or you have a, a flash of a revelatory episode, which is beyond time and space. You literally go beyond the body because the vibration goes higher and higher beyond the perception of a, of a body, which is a, a, the body, the world is a very dense, slow, slow moving um, perception. That's all it really is. It's, it's all energy, but when you're in lower frequencies, it just appears to be real. It appears to have a solidity that's not really there. It has an appearance that's not really there. It's just like a, a, a picture show that's been slowed down enough so that it seems a bit solid, but it's not really the, the actual case. So here we go. And here's Dan, you know, Dan's been told by the doctor, Dan's been told by the, his coach, all of his teammates, in their minds, it's all over. It's over. And you can see when, when Socrates first said, you know, uh, you, I think you should devote your training, to, your mind to your gymnastics training, big reaction from, uh, from Dan. It's like, that shows you the fear that's underneath. Like, you, you, I've had an accident. I've, I'm damaged goods, is basically what he's, he's trying to tell Socrates. I'm damaged goods. What are you trying to do to me? And Socrates is not having any of it, because he's, he knows that there's still a love and a devotion, that she, he still has a love of the gymnastics. So Socrates is going to use his love of the gymnastics to train the mind to come closer to the present moment. You see, that's how it works. It's never, it, even baking a sherry pie, I can assure you, it, it's aimed at the present moment. I've done it. I've actually baked a sherry pie. David. <laughs> but, and it was very tasty actually. But, it's still, I did not get obsessed with it. I didn't, you know, think I'm a chef now or something like that. No, it's, it's, it was just a step of coming closer to the present moment. And, and that's just from allowing myself to be done through, you know, so that, so that the pie could come out good out of the, out of the oven. And, and that's what's going on. So, it, so it, also for, for Jiska Helena, for, for the mother concept, you will seem to be, become actually a better and better mother um, to the world's eyes, you know, to an extent, you know, it, it, it goes to an extent where you, they feel the love, the, the all-inclusive love, the, the embrace, the non-judgment is felt. As you start to loosen the mind from all the roles, then you get happier and happier and happier. And actually, that's what everybody is rooting for anyway. Deep down, every parent, every child wants to see a happy parent and a happy child. If, if mom or children are become consistently happy, you know you're getting closer and closer to the Christ. Because at the beginning when I was going through all these changes and I'm doing the course and everything, you know, for my parents it seemed to be quite a ride because they're like, so what are you going to do for a living? You know, that was the big question. What are you going to do for a living, David? You know, we can see you like this book. But, uh, you know, that's not in their, in their concept for their, for their child is, you know, self, something with A Course in Miracles. For them it was like, but, what are you going to do for a living? And then, you know, when are you going back to school? Are you going to finish your master's degree? You know, and, and you were offered a, an opportunity to get a scholarship for a doctorate degree, and you're turning that down. That, that wasn't looking so good, 
you know, they were saying, you didn't finish the master's, you turned down the doctorate, and what are you going to do for a living? You know, that was like the bottom line. What will you do for a living? And, and yet, um, I would go to the course groups, and there was five course groups a week, and all these different things. Somehow, I was getting happier. Uh, behind everything, even though in their perception probably they're thinking, oh my God, he's going to be a beggar. <laughs> it's a, a nightmare, a nightmare outcome for mom and dad. What, how's your son doing? He has 10 years of university. What's, what's he, how's he applying that? He's turning into St. Francis. He's a beggar, you know. You know, it's, it's, it's like a black mark, like on the, on their, whole life work and loaning him money for college and all these different things and then what what's become of him he's a, he's, a, he's a beggar like saint francis they didn't say that they just had a scowl on their face like oh, don't ask <laughs> don't even ask but these are just transitions too because you have to follow your heart you have to go for it and you can't be so concerned with what people think because they really aren't thinking it's just it's just thoughts in the mind and consciousness. They aren't really out there. The thoughts are not out there, other people thinking. It's just thoughts, self-concept judgments that you have about yourself that is the problem. That's where the guilt's coming in. It's all just in the mind. It's not really out there. And it takes you a while to really start to, to figure that out, to start to realize that. But, but then once you do get glimmers of that, then, then you're just more like, okay, Holy Spirit, Jesus, use me then. Use me in whatever would bless the whole sonship or whatever would bless the whole universe. And at this point, you know, this is a, this is a key point because Socrates has not advised him to push away from something that he still has fear about underneath. He wants him to Kind of like, again, revolver, and embrace the pain, Jake, and you will win the game. You know, that's what the two guys are telling Jake in uh, revolver. Embrace the pain and you will win the game. In other words, don't, don't project the pain and don't deny the pain. Don't push anything away. Say, oh, I'm spiritual now. now I'm done with this mom thing. Never going to be a mom again. I don't want to change the diaper again. You know, you can't, you can't push it away. Because if you put, make it something and you try to push it, then it's going to keep it. What you, try, what you resist persists. What you try to project out, what you try to push away will still be there. And neither can you deny it. You know, you can't, you can't just say, well, I'm going to have to put my spiritual journey on hold for another... Uh, 14 years here, and then I'll pick it up, Jesus, uh, 14 years later. That's not going to work either. Uh, you know, it's like Jesus is like, what, are you going to stay on the one-inch line and, and just play games and not do anything? What about your spiritual practice? You know, you can't, you can't stuff it away. You, and, you, and sometimes people try to embrace the concept. I'm going to be the best mom in the history of the universe. They're going to make statues out on the, the square or by the stadium that have me with holding my children in my arms, three of them, four of them, and the and best mom in the history of the world. You, know, you, can't, you can't escape it by embracing this best thing. You know, I'm going to be the best mom. I'm, I'm not going to have any guilt. I'm going to be super mom. Supermom. No, you can't, you can't do it by embellishing it, and neither can you escape it by pushing it away and saying, no, I don't, I don't do the mom thing again. No. Groceries? No. Never again. Cook? No. You know, you see Francis' movie, uh, that's what Francis Romero went through. She prayed that she would be able to feel her worth for who she was without cooking. And then she forgot the prayer, and she got all upset. You probably remember from Take Me Home, when, when she was put in a position to follow Jen. And Jen, she doesn't do, do toast. You know, she can't do toast. You know, she's like saying, well, I, I made a salad and everything, and, but I don't, know, I don't know what a crouton is. 
Oh boy, that's, that's the final blow for Francis Romero, you know, it's like, oh great, I'm now subordinate to a woman who doesn't know what a crouton is. She can't do toast. And that's why she steamed and stomped out and packed her car up and everything because that was a major hit to the ego. It was like, she forgot her prayer, which was to be loved and worthy for herself, for who she really was. She forgot the prayer, and then she got caught up in the self-concept of nobody, you know, you'll see, I'm going to leave, and then the whole mystery school of uh, food thing is going to collapse, and then you'll get your comeuppance. You know, then you, oh, you spiritual teachers, you know, you, what do you find out when the 30 people want some food and there's nothing but salads with no croutons? Uh, you know, see if, see if you get, if they're happy campers then, you know. <laughs> with the just lettuce and nothing else, you know, from this woman who can't do toast. Well, you know, this is the way it goes. The ego always is trying to maintain and improve upon a self-concept. And it's telling you, if you become a better person, a better human being, you'll be more lovable and more likable. And there's even studies done. People that are more beautiful, they have better relationships, people that are more handsome, more skilled, more abilities, they get more pay, they get to do the good jobs, they get to get all the accolades, they get to do the, win the Academy Awards, and all the, they get all that, and there's a lot of programming that says if you become a better person, you're going to be happier. And Jesus is like, no, no, you were created perfect, but you will never reach a, a confident person. You won't even reach an enlightened person concept. That's another one that has to go. You know, the idea of lightened beings and avatars and, you know, all that stuff, saints, you know, those are just stepping stone ideas to letting go of, of everything that you believe. Because at no single instant does the body exist, so you can't really have an enlightened person because enlightened is the present moment and person is, is time. So let's just see how it goes here because I think that's, I had to bring this up into awareness because, because he has to face his fears and, and actually him training in gymnastics is the best way for him to face his fears without just pushing away the whole gymnastics. Say, I'm ready to be Mother Teresa. He said, I'm ready for service, right? Full service. I've got a case of Mother Teresa-itis, and I'm ready to, to jump into that. And he's like, no, no, continue your training as a gymnast, because Socrates knows that, that he's just going to get into another self-concept. If he pushes away what he loves, gymnastics, he's just going to go off into another self-concept and get, get caught into something else, and it's not going not to help him at all. Okay, let's roll him. Yeah, that's a good one. There it is. So it's not the outcome that's important. It's the present. It's the purpose of this moment that's everything. And, and all of the hike was just to reveal that what they're calling the journey is, is the moment. To be content with the moment is is the greatest gift, because there's no self-concept in that gift, in that moment. And so you can start to see that it's all this pursuit in destinations, in goals, in outcomes, that is the denial of the instant. It's, that's the busyness. That's why they call it, uh, and I think in Buddhism they call it the monkey mind, because monkeys are are busy. If you ever watch monkeys, <laughs> sometimes they sit still, but they're very, very active. And that's why they call it the monkey mind. It's, it's, the, it's the belief in hypotheticals, it's the belief that, that, that this world is nothing but hypotheticals and that, that something lies in the future that has value, and, and that's actually not the case. So, it also points us back to that idea, if we let go of outcomes, then we let go of expectations. If we let go of outcomes and expectations, we get let go of hypothetical destinations. This idea that 
somehow you're going to arrive at something in the future. You know, if, if you go into the Course, you can read the section called The Immediacy of Salvation. Be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward. For you have cause for freedom now. What an amazing teaching. That's, Jesus is now expanding on the Kingdom of Heaven is at hand. He's expanding on, on forgiveness to, to bring us back to the now moment and to this idea that things will never get better or worse than they are right now. Things will never ultimately be different because there aren't really outcomes. It's a trick to believe in outcomes. And all of the self-concept is just the belief in outcomes. You go to a movie, you come back, and somebody says, did you see a movie? Yes. Was it any good? There you go. Was it any good? Doesn't matter what you say. Good, bad, this, this, this. You know, it's like the underlying question is always, what is the outcome? That's why my mom and dad were so concerned about David with his Course in Miracles book. It's like, good, good, so it's, you've got a book now. You're reading a book. Okay, what are you going to do for a living? <laughs> that's, like, that's the role that they were placed to play. What are you going to do for a living? That's part of the parental role, you know. Oh, be happy! Don't worry about studies, don't worry about your education. That's your Jesus, <laughs> inner, inner Jesus talking to you. Be content, be happy in the moment. Don't be concerned about the morrow. He said that 2,000 years ago. Let the morrow take care of the morrow. Take no thought for what you shall wear, what you shall eat. Wow, you know, he was teaching it 2,000 years ago. He was teaching, be happy, be content in the moment. The Kingdom of Heaven is at hand. Rabbi, what are you talking about? Rabboni, what are you talking about? What do you mean the Kingdom of Heaven is at hand? You know, well, he said, when you see the, when you feel the warm airs come from the south, uh, you know it will be hot. And when you see the clouds come, you know it will rain and so forth. How can you not understand the symbols? The Kingdom of Heaven is at hand. He was just proclaiming the present moment. But, and he was saying, how can you not see the symbols? Like, look at what I'm demonstrating. <laughs> the glee, the joy, the simplicity, the happiness of the Christ. How can you not see the signs of the Christ? Because only outcomes, only pursuits of this world, only hypotheticals, thinking that there's something going to come in the future, that's, that's the whole defense against the holy instant. So, you know, practically speaking, Jesus is saying, well, it's okay if you loosen up your, your belief in these future outcomes and just tune into my guidance inside of you, because that will direct all your ways. He's not leaving us high and dry and just saying, you know, you are nothing. Um, who am I, Jesus? You are pure emptiness. Doesn't actually sound very appealing, pure emptiness. Uh, I, I have fun discussions about that, you know, all the ideas of empty, empty your mind, empty your mind, empty your mind, the Zen stick smack, empty your mind, empty your mind. Actually emptiness does not sound very appealing, but if you think of the fullness of being light, of being everything, of being one with God, of being a perfect child of God, of a perfectly loving source, then, then there's a fulfillment of, oh my gosh, the I amness, you know, is, is what is the proclamation of, of Jesus. That's, that's what this is all about. And it's full, it's full of laughter, it's full of joy, it's full of happiness, it's full of glee, it's full of wonder, 
It's wonderful. You can, you can have some fun. Happiness is fun. It's actually fun. Life is fun. Life is fun. When we're children, we're a little closer to that until we start to take on the mask a little more. We take the mask pretty seriously. We hear it enough from our parents until we finally have the thought, what am I going to do for a living? <laughs> then that's a serious thought. I've got some seriousness going in with that, living. Because we think the living is the form. You know, how, how will I survive? You know, how will I survive? And yet, when you follow the guidance, you're in for the ride of your life. I mean, you ain't seen nothing if you've been in survival mode and then you get into the guidance, because the guidance, it, it lights your life up, it lights your mind up, it, it brings a sense of ease and relaxation. So, let's see how the movie closes here. He's finally found the rock. <laughs> and uh, this is not just a regular rock, it's like he finally, he was again given spaciousness from Socrates you know, all the insights come from inside you. You see how Socrates just, he points to the rock and he said, I never know what, I didn't know I'd find this either. Because he's pointing to there's no outcomes. The rock was not the outcome. Then he walks away and gives Dan just a moment to find the inside for himself. And then Dan says, it's in the journey. It's not in the destination. You see how easy it is for us when we just take a moment to be open. And we have, Socrates already told him, you have all the answers already. The, all the answers are inside you. And Socrates is really mirroring that. He's showing that he can step back and have total disregard for whether Dan will understand or not. Because Dan, he trusts. I know you have the answers inside you. I know you will find the answers. And you need to do this for yourself because nobody can tell you, like in the Matrix, nobody can tell you, the, the Oracle tells Neo in Matrix 1, nobody can tell you you're the one, you have to know it for yourself. Yeah, you have to know it. You have to come to that insight purely on your own. You, this is not something that gets, a magic wand comes out and you get hit in the head with a magic wand or something, and you know, it's just not going to go that way. It has to be this, ah, I see, I recognize, ah, I see it, I see it. So let's see how the movie ends. Then we, I love to hear your comments on <laughs> this one. Let's see how the movie goes here. Hmm, beautiful, 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 beautiful. What a movie. <laughs> What a journey, huh? <laughs> I really enjoy the journey of that one. That's fantastic. So, yeah, let's um, have, have Eric open it up to hear what, what insights came to you during this movie. Because that's the key. That's always the, ble the greatest blessing is the insights. Go ahead, Stephen. Hey, great. Um, thank you. Boy, um, good stuff. High fives all around and all of that. That final scene there where those rings, they were just coming together into the one ring. And I just love that imagery there of the, the, the duality collapsing, time collapsing into the moment and, and, and how that was depicted and how they always referred to him as Lord of the Rings. Back at, back at when he has been in his ass holiness. And, um, you know, of course, the Lord of the Rings is Sauron. It's the, it's the dark tower. It's the dark force. And he was in that egoic um, idea of himself. And, of course, I, I feel that going through my journey of that, that contrast, that those contrasts are just becoming greater and greater. And I'm just still uh, amazed or surprised even at how often I get pumped by the ego, and that I can't trust the entire construct of me and all my ideas about time and, and going through, um, it's funny how ego has its own recovery program. And I see that, and, and so ego is always trying to recover 
it, it gets you to recover, get back into the recovery program, but it's ego's recovery program, and recover that vitality, recover the idea of the body. Uh, you're getting older. Um, you're running out of time. You better get this right, so you better do some push-ups. You better make it happen and get it all right, but that's the ego just trying to recover itself because there's this bright light, as you've been describing, um, and, and that experience of the, of the light in here and, and coming out of the darkness of the ego, and then there's always the counterattack. There's always the backsliding, the backlash, the ego just ready, waiting to pounce, and then it seems to go dark, and there's that, um, going back to Rescue Trinity, there's that special relationship, and boy, how that just plays itself out, and you see it and see it and see it, but here's the source, and then here's to go back and get Trinity and go in unconscious and trying to get the body right, um, to try to be the right right man. And I thought, boy, that's always been the trap and always been the setup. But here it just played out so beautifully and then your setup about that. And I see that. I see that happening very clearly and I can feel it. And that, like I said, that contrast is so uh, beautiful. It's, it's a, they're irreconcilable thought system. There's no question about it. And so watching that play itself out, but then it, you don't have to spend so long in hell. And I love the, the, the notion of the, the, we're on the journey to Jerusalem. We're all going to enter Jerusalem. The palms are going to be waving, and it's going to be fantastic uh, to enter Jerusalem, the place of peace. And it, I feel like I'm on that road to Jerusalem with Jesus, and I'm Pinocchio, and I want to go off into the detours, into the cabarets, uh, figuratively. And, and, and Jesus is just saying, that's okay. It's just going to delay our entrance into Jerusalem, but I'll go with you. And you're going to go dark and you're going to go unconscious because you still see that flashing light of an idea of yourself, of the letting go of the idea of myself as a man, as a body in time. So I love how this played out for me to see that and just have that reinforced. And David, I want to say thank you for your, your seminar uh, guidance. I listened to a couple of the sessions on Spreaker and boy, you just knocked it out of the park on Saturday morning session on guidance, and that clarified it of it's the present moment. It's not really about time at all, but it's about collapsing time versus the ego's use of what to do in time versus the Holy Spirit's um, bringing you into that present moment. So that was so beautifully done and so, so helpful. And I thought something's going on here because I've been listening to this wonderful choir music and one by Paul Mueller, and there's a song called Salvatore Mundi which is really the uh, Latin for savior of the earth, a uh, savior of the world. And it's referencing a painting by Leonardo da Vinci called Salvatore Mundi. It's a beautiful painting. I was never aware of it, but it's a picture of, of, of Christ, of Jesus. Um, and in his right hand, he's given the blessing. It's just, just the symbol of the blessing. And in his left hand, he's holding this crystal orb, but it's clear. It's a clear glass it's a crystal ball and so when you were talking about the crystal ball <laughs> I thought, did, 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 did you hear that song did he go research salvatore mundi and here's, here's so i'm just thinking i can't believe what i'm hearing but it's it's the I, i've forgiven the world is the blessing uh yeah. the, of the world and he's holding this ball and you have to go look it up go go to wikipedia somewhere <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing um, image, and I guess it was the highest uh, painting ever sold for like 455 million, something like that. But that, that's not important. The value in it, in it for me is the the echo, the mirror, saying, "Hey, brother, brother Stephen, here's the, you, you forgive the world, for, forgive it, release it, and and release. And this this crystal ball will be clear. It'll be a clear orb, and that's your innocent mind. That's the truth." And yes, it's going to, you're going to be just kind of winding your way at times back and forth. But I, I just love this movie. And, I, and the whole specialness thing, I, we watched Lucy, you know, a couple times ago, I think it was. Um, but I love that theme of Lucy and, and the Scarlett Johansson version of her, you know, collapsing time. And I think of Lucy, too, in that sense, but also Lucy and Charlie Brown. And I thought, there's specialness right there, that Lucy is... In that sense, Lucy is the ego, the special relationship that's always going to punk me if I think that it's going to bring me anything. It's, Lucy's never going to hold the football. All Charlie Brown wants to do is kick that football. But it ain't going to ever happen because Lucy 
in that sense, is programmed to, to never make, let it happen. All, and specialness is just always punking, but we get better. I get better at catching the punk. I still think sometimes I could make that work. But it's, it's kind of like, no, it's just got to be released completely. And I think that's the letting it go of the idea of myself. All the roles, and that's okay. I, I'm, I'm getting better at letting go of all these roles. And I, but I have to take issue with one thing you said um, in terms of uh, the best and the worst. I have proof. Now, now I'm, I'm a granddad, and on Father's Day, my grandchildren made me a, a thing. And I didn't want to be called granddad. I just didn't have, a, I didn't like that sound of that word because it made me think I was getting old. And of course, that connects me with this time bound creature. So we can't have any of that granddad stuff. So I thought, well, they can call me Don Esteban because that's like a spiritual title or something. So we can spiritualize it and I can be called Don Esteban. I thought, no, nah, it's kind of complicated for kids. So they just call me Don Don. And it's fun and it's cute. But they made me something. I don't think you see this, but it's. The best Don Don. Best Don Don. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll close with that. I'm, I'm just teasing, of course. And I thought, well, there's only one Don Don, so I can play with that. And, and maybe in time and space, he's the best and the worst, and there's, there's neither. But uh, thank you so much. Once again, there's so much good stuff here. Um, but I love the Lord of the Rings, the play on that, and the collapse of the rings, and all those beautiful lessons. And uh, thanks for the setup, and thanks again for your tirelessness. And, and um, Saturday's session was just boom. That that there was a pop to that. And I, I just felt minds were melting because you're talking about the crystal ball. And I thought, go look up Salvatore Mundi, the painting man. <laughs> Very good, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it's interesting too because when I asked um, Jesus years ago to give me a map of the mind, he gave me five rings and uh, desire, and then uh, belief and thought, emotions, and perceptions. And then, um, and then he gave me this, like a beautiful slice through the middle, which he called forgiveness, where everything, all, all of them were in perfect alignment. And uh, that, that really stuck with me. And then, in the end, I did a talk one time, uh, talking about those rings, and it came out of my mouth, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, in that sense, is a reinterpretation of of being in alignment, so you have, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world and all the rings through the desire for the holy instant. So, so it's really beautiful that way and um, that's how Spiri evolved and Instrument for Peace and uh, ISO. <laughs> ISO's in, in full play mode tonight. He's, uh, he's getting close to our microphone and so Susan had to go capture him. But uh, but that, that idea of you know, having dominion over the, over the earth is really in our mind when we forgive, then, then that's it. That's the whole thing for me. It's, I never actually have really ever watched the trilogy of Lord of the Rings. It was all for me and Jesus uh, showing those levels of mind and, and how we could be in alignment and we didn't have to be at the mercy of anything, that we were totally empowered when we are in alignment with our source. So. So thank you. That's beautiful. I will have to try to check out. I had that crystal ball on my left and I was doing, my hands were going. Yep, I did the blessing thing. So you caught that. You really caught that one. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to Sue Young. Sue Young next. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Hello, David. Hello, hi. everyone. Yeah. Hi, hi. Hi. Well, I have never spoken in Zoom gathering. I think this is the right time for me to, to speak. Yeah, I would like to share a miracle. A um, few weeks ago, I watched Ken's um, Get Real episode, and he made a prayer. He said, bring it on. And I thought, wow. I join in, so I pray really deeply, bring it down. And then I say, I want to speed up in this awakening. And then after that, I discover that I have this eye disease and I cannot see clearly with my right eye. And the world now look really distorted and very surreal. And 
this is a journey that a lot of fear has been flushed up. And last night I woke up in the middle of the night and so much fear came up. So I pray for a miracle and Holy Spirit just gently brought me back step by step, just bring me up out of the battleground. And then he said to me that this, what I see now is just a sweet reminder to tell me that the word is not real. And it's such a sweet reminder, just keep reminding me that, okay, you are dreaming, this is surreal, this is distorted, not clear. Yeah, so I know that now it started because of the prayer. I say, I want to speed up, and now we go. And, and I'm very grateful for, for the metaphor. You, you say that I'm now in this water slide, and now I, I pray that I will, I will do this. I will really do this. Yeah, because I want to have fun. So I will, I will keep in my mind to do this and, and just let Holy Spirit guide me. And I'm very grateful for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's a great reminder, too, because over the years, I've had all kinds of experiences that have come on, and that's the kind of the spirit that I take them when they come. Like sometimes people talk about like when they get a, like a ringing in their ear. And when I get, had a ringing in my ear that wouldn't go away, I thought, oh, he's really emphasizing that the world's unreal. Or if I would have a blurred vision or a blocked ear or anything that would happen in my perception of the body or the world, I would take it that way um, of thank you. Thank you for this reminder, uh, because it is a blessing that way. And so I love how you've you've taken that when when you seem to have this distorted vision, you know, then that you've turned it into the most wonderful reminder and blessing. And it just shows you our powerful power of interpretation that uh, nothing really happens to us; everything happens for us. And when we want to see the blessing, like the uh, Stephen was just saying, not looking to the ball, the crystal ball in the hand, but to the blessing. You've just shown it right after he spoke. Now you've given us an example of seeing the blessing in everything. So thank you. And thank you for speaking up. It's like not holding back communication, your first Zoom communication. We, we all feel it. You've, you're, you're turned loose on the whole universe now. <laughs> it's your initiation. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to Esther next. Go ahead, Esther. Hi, David. Hi. I had a lot of darkness come up about a day and a half ago, and I was crying that I didn't feel that I wanted to give 100% to God. And then um, Alan made an observation that Maybe I should stay away from sweet things because I was very emotional. <laughs> so I did, and I realized that I um, that that was a self concept that was saying that, and that it wasn't true. And what happened today was um, I went I went shopping and I was buying something, and it said to look at both items to make sure they were what I wanted. And I just couldn't look further than what I did. And I found out that I did get the wrong thing. And there was such regret. And I was using the, the teaching from the movie tonight to say that, well, what, what shocked me was, was that this, this guidance um, that, like with the, with the burn on the hand that one time I described and, and the ego or whatever it is, the voice that's coming in and saying, no, you can't look, you know, um, is it that this is happening so that, well, I'm thinking like if something was important and this, and I had to make the, and I had to look or I had to pay attention because the spirit's telling me to, 
would I? Is this just a, hopefully this is a training ground for me to get used to, but, but this, this not being able to look was so intense that I was uncomfortable and I couldn't look at what I was buying. And this, this, this uncomfortability happens and I want to, I want to see that I'm not that so that I can look. And I, what, what can I do to train myself? Am I doing enough? Well, I think that scene in the movie, you know, toward the end with Joy. Joy's jogging. Um, he's sitting there. He sees Joy. He's got his book. He wants to tell Joy something. He hasn't been really telling Joy much um, all along, really, you know. This is the, the, the theme about holding back. Some, when we hesitate, when we hold back, is because we, there's a doubt. There's still a doubt. And all doubt is self-doubt. It's just a doubt of who we are. And so to me that was very symbolic that he, he's got his book in his hand, he starts running alongside her, and uh, she starts asking him a few questions, uh, like, what are you out doing? Just, just running with a book. You know, <laughs> she's right on to him right away. You know, you're just out running with a book, with a book in hand. Yeah, right. So you see how she calls him on it immediately. Like he's, he's not quite ready yet to communicate fully what's on his heart. And then he says, as he's running along, side along with, with, with his book in hand, he says, I think I want to kiss you. And she doesn't respond at all. She doesn't say yes, she doesn't say no, she doesn't stop, you know. She's that in that steady rhythm of she's just out running, you know. She's in her, her glory, she's just running and running and running. So he, his line, I would think I want to kiss, I think I want to kiss you, you know. Socrates taught him there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is, is thinking it, but wisdom is doing it. And he's just saying, I think I want to kiss you. You see, he's not to the wisdom. He's not put it into practice. And then as she just continues on, doesn't break stride. Joy doesn't break stride. Joy doesn't break stride. Joy, joy is just joy. Joy just goes. And then she's going, she's going. And then he, now he's got to really speak up, you see, because she's not uh, waiting for him. He's, now he really has to let it come out and say what he needs to say. And he says, you know, I see things, and uh, I, see it, I see us together, you know. She's off, Joy is still off running. She's getting farther and farther away, I see us together. You know, it really might happen. And then she turns around and she says, maybe it will, you know. And then at the end you see how he, he married Joy. So... This is the same progress. That beautiful little scene is all for you right now, of seeing whenever you have a doubt, or whenever you criticize yourself, or whenever you think you fall short, just remember that scene, that you need to keep the faith, because you can do it. You know, I've told you this, you, you're going to transcend this ego. I know it. And you just need to keep the faith. Think of him where he just, little by little, you know, he says, you know, uh, I think I want to kiss you, and then he keeps going. I see us together. You can think about that with God. I see us together. <laughs> maybe it'll happen. Maybe, maybe it will. You know, it, it's, it's actually assured. And so that's where the development of faith, we have to keep the faith. You know, because really that union is our destiny. Uh, we were created one, we're destined to be one. We can't mess it up, we can't mess it up. We may seem to be able to delay in temporary terms, uh, but more and more the, our heart starts to open. We, we realize we don't want to delay. We really deserve to experience ourselves as we were created. So just remember that little scene. And how he doesn't give up. He finally has to say it. He has to say it and speak it and mean it. And she, she turns back to acknowledge him, you know, as she feels it. That's the way joy is. Joy is just calling us, calling all of us. So thank you, Esther. We love you. you 
You wear your heart right on your face all the time. We, we feel it. We feel it. It's precious. Okay. We go to Annie next. Go ahead, Annie. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, Annie. Hi. That, I really enjoyed that movie. I, I've known about that book, but I've never read it and haven't seen the movie. Um, so it brought up some things for me. One thing I was noticing was um, the ending. Like, I feel like I've, I think I'm hopefully moving out of it, but I get so stuck in the, um, I do get stuck in the outcome still, like sort of go part way, you know, like um, part way and giving up things and um, letting go and the purification and whatever. And then I, and then I look for, immediately look for the outcome. So I really felt for him when, like, for instance, in that scene where he was being, where they were being held up and it was like, okay, um, I'm thinking the right thoughts. I'm thinking um, in, de in my defenselessness, my safety lies. And so where's my miracle? Like I, I get stuck there quite a bit. And, um, you know, instead of, I guess in part, it, it, it's very helpful. Like Stephen said, I've been listening to your guidance talk this weekend too and found it so so helpful and I and it does come back to well it's a it's a moment thing it's not it's in the now it's not in the outcome but I was thinking about how the movie even is kind of ego based in the ending because that's it's kind of like it's sort of you could see it as like uh, if you do all of these things you you get to win the gold medal or I don't know if you want a gold medal, but you still get every you know, you still get everything you wanted and you get the spiritual thing too. And I feel like um for me that's something I've really had to let go of, saying, No, it's not about having the spiritual thing and getting the outcome you want. It's just purely staying with the now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. I think I think it's beautiful that we're in this journey together because um, I think, like even with the Course, it's, it's a book that has all kinds of metaphors and it's almost like sometimes I think Jesus just like lowered a ladder down into time and space and he just said, grab hold anywhere. You can grab the bottom of it, you can grab the middle of it, you can grab any rung, just grab it. Uh, wherever you seem to be, just grab hold and then and and I'll, I'm taking. I'm going to help you take you up, I'll take you up and out and and beyond. And I think that the thing I love is just the practicality. Like even when we see, see a movie like this, um, you can you can notice that that there's a yearning inside you to to go beyond what we'll call happy endings. Um, you know, like. A lot of movies, you know, go for some kind of an ending, a happy ending. And you can just come back more and more to that faith and trust that you, that you can't mess it up and that, that that's just, those are just kind of seeming steps along the way where we seem to, I call them whims. When something comes, it's a symbol that we can relate to and it, it seems to have a meaning for us, but we feel a bit of a heartwarming uh, with it. But in the end, we, we, I think we are taken towards the light through attraction. Um, we become more and more attracted to the light, and the, and the more we are attracted to the light, it seems to have a neutralizing effect on the world, where we just can be so patient with, with whatever's happening, because a, a, a certain outcome is assured, and it's really not even an outcome, it's just an awareness of, of all is well that we're being taken into. So I'd like to think of just how, how inevitable that is. You know, it's, uh, it takes the, the self-evaluation off or the self-criticism uh, away when we start to just relax into, you know, we're, we're being carried there, literally carried into that experience. And so I like that we practice the, uh, not getting, p pushing things away or or becoming enamored with, with things, um, we just notice if there's a tendency to still want to do that um, with anything. And um, we're just walking to this 
together, supporting and nurturing each other, kind of cheering each other on, uh, always coming back to that inevitability of, of things. So, I'm glad, I'm glad you got to experience this movie, because it's, uh, yeah, many people have heard of the book, but, but this movie, it's, I don't know, it just says, it's just a great reminder for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Okay, I'm going to go to Dennis next. Hi, right, Dennis. Hi. Hi, Dennis. Hi, David. How are you? <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I had about four months ago, I had been, actually, it's been a couple of years where I've been trying to understand guidance. And, and about four months ago, um, after a conversation with Sarah St. Clair, um, where I was talking to her and it seemed like, I was telling her that, you know, it seems really laborious and, and kind of awkward or not awkward, but some kind of word like that where um, you got to ask spirit for everything that you do. And, uh, <clears throat> and it felt to me like what was working for me was that I was just staying in the flow as long as my mind was fairly peaceful, wasn't getting caught in ego. Whatever I did, was fine. And, and I could feel it was really clear because there was such a contrast between the ego and, and the flow or the, the, the peaceful mind. And, uh, and then about four months ago, I had this um, period of time, and I still have it, but it's uh, not as strong as it was for that period of time where I realized that the only, the only thing, the only, absolutely only thing that I need to worry about is staying in that peaceful place. I didn't need to make decisions about things because they would come out of that place. And whatever it was, <laughs> it was what it was and it was fine. It was not a problem. And uh, so when I came, uh, you know, I, I kept with that. And then uh, I told my wife that I was not going to compromise on, on, uh, live in this way, that I really had to follow guidance. I had to follow it all the time. Of course, I haven't done that altogether, but <clears throat> it doesn't matter because it seems like that's really made a lot of, those two things have really made a lot of difference. So coming to Canvas, I had already been practicing doing that, staying with presence and being in the flow as much as I could. <laughs> and <clears throat> when I got here the first month, it was pretty easy. And it was basically the same kind of thing as I had been doing all along before I came here. But then I got made steward July 1st. And <clears throat> that taking on that responsibility, that role, brought up some of the ego stuff that was still remaining. That <clears throat> uh, I was just stressed. And part of it was just overwhelm and too many things, too many new things all at once for me. And uh, But then I moved through that. And this kind of uh, staying in that stillness at times with that presence is really, really powerful and really, really strong. And uh, and, I, and I can clearly see how much being in service makes a huge difference. As being in service, it keeps that alive, that keeps that presence <clears throat> constantly there and I can tell when I take a break go off and read some email or whatever it is that it weakens and uh, so and, it's, and it really it's pretty obvious that I have to find ways when I leave here to keep me in that service all the time and I, I will continue to do the subtitling but I think there's more that I need to take on um, so that my time is all altogether given to service, 24-7. I've been practicing waking up in the morning and say, this holy day I give to you, be you in charge, for I would follow you. And uh, <clears throat> knowing that you will, knowing now I forget what it is, <laughs> knowing that you will give me peace or 
Yeah. Whatever. So, and I do that in, when I go to bed too at night and sometimes during the day. And, but that's my total one, one goal. My only purpose is that. And it's getting clearer and clearer. That it, and it's getting simpler, but it's still the ego keeps popping up and saying, no, I, <laughs> you're not going to go there. And, and I'm sure I'm going to be tested at some point. Really, really intensely, but we'll see what happens then. If I'm, because I think it's just a muscle that you build, a habit that you build that gets stronger and stronger, and it gives you more and more confidence to keep doing that. And because it also makes you happier, and, and it makes you be so connected with people in that spirit that the love is right there, palpable. What's the word? Palpable. Anyways, it's really obvious and clear and beautiful. Intimate. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. So. Oh, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, it's like the, the Holy Spirit uses what the ego made. So even though the ego made the roles, then the Spirit uses them in a like a step by step way to, in more, I'll say more and more expansive roles, um, reaching all the way to forgiveness. And and so that's why it, it's that's just the way that it goes. And even with this movie, you know, I noticed that at the Texaco station, when they had a certain shot where it said full service at the beginning, and then at the end it, it was changed to self service. Um, so to me, that was like the merge. It went from full service with Socrates as the example, and then finally it was like, now you've got it. Kind of like at the end of Beggar Vance when, you know, they're on the final hole, the 18th, the final, final, final hole of the whole tournament. And then Beggar Vance, the caddy, just goes off and, and goes happily skipping and walking down the, uh, down the uh, ocean front as he goes and, and makes that long putt at the very end because he's, he's then ready to take it fully you know, to go, to take the guidance fully in. So I see that you're, that's what you're doing when you wake up in the morning and, and you have that, this holy instant, what I give to you, be you in charge, for I would but follow, you know, certain that your way, you know, gives me peace. And then whatever you're needed to do or whatever, given a word or a thought or just flowing during the day, just in that service mode, it, it takes you away from egocentric thought because you're getting in service mode is giving mode. And giving mode is, is fantastic because that's all we're trying to do is learn to give as God gives, you know, with no thought of reciprocity or no, no, no expectations in return, just true uh, giving and generosity. So it's beautiful. You're just describing there, right there in co-living, you're, you're just giving your gift, gift of, of, of how it's working for you and, and uh, how helpful it is. So thank you. That's a testimony. That's really a testimony. Thank you, Dennis. That's beautiful. Okay, I'm going to go to Julie next. Julie, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, Julie. This was, hi. This was an amazing, amazing movie. Um, at the beginning of the movie, uh, the, well, the first part, I, uh, I really, um, um, uh, touched something very, uh, very deep and, and, and what feels very old as well, um, was the, the belief that I am not enough and because um, the, how the ego was uh, putting it in front of me, my God, my heart is, is, is beating so hard. Whew. Um, is that I was so young when I, you know, I, I, I like I was 10 when I, uh, around 10 anyways, I saw that movie of um, Jonathan Livingston, The Seagull. 
I think it is. Um, uh, for, uh, what's his name? Bach. Richard Bach. Yes. Richard Bach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that movie, and it um, it changed my life. And uh, and then I I read his book, Illusion, and then uh, the book One, and then Dan Millman, and then. Paramahansa Yogananda, the autobiography of it. And, and I, I, it was a, as if in a desert, and, and all of a sudden the rain, I, I, I would like just <laughs> drink and drink and reread the same paragraph 10 times. Um, and I thought, uh, I, I didn't know that the ego would grab that. And I don't know. I, uh, I just what I mean. What I mean now is that the ego took me for a ride for years after after those um, books and 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 moment of uh, um, of of miracles. And because I was still angry sometimes, and I was still. Uh, possessive or whatever you know i and so the ego made me believe that this i i was not enough that that this after years and years and years and i mean i'm 54 and you know years and years you're still angry sometimes see this thing doesn't work and i i believed it and now i i i felt um, while watching the movie that um, I, I saw something else and it, it's not true. It's not true that what ego was telling me. And I felt that freedom uh, as if I was released. Um, so thank you. <laughs> and, um, and also at the end when, when, um, He's doing his, his uh, routine, and um, he hears the voice of Socrates, and where are you here? When are you now? And what are you, or who are you? What are you, I think? I was wondering, like, what's that question? Like, what is the answer? And it, it was like, as if all of a sudden it became in slow motion, and I was waiting for that answer and when he said this moment i felt i was this moment mm -hmm. and so the here and the now are this moment but there's nothing else than this moment including me and all the rest because when when he is in the moment, it grabs everyone with him. And we are all the same moment. And so this was, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and also, um, one last thing that I wanted to share, because um, I find that... Um, I've been using the, the prayer, um, I'm here only to be truly helpful. And, um, and while uh, listening to, to, to Dan Millman going, going through all that, I was, I was thinking, like, um, how come I don't feel the peace you know, when I, when I say that prayer and I and, and I use it before I enter somewhere or bef and how come I don't feel that that peacefulness that I that that David is talking about and I and then I I, I notice that um, the voice of the ego is judging everything um, that I that that follows up that prayer so. Because if, like today, I was I was arriving in this in this house, um, and and there there is a, someone that I, I I don't really know, and I know he's there, and I know he he's I think he's suffering, 
And so I smiled. And Ego already said, like, okay, so what's next? What can you do? And what else do you do to help? Like, and so I, but I am not the doer. And, 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 <laughs> and now um, listening to the movie um, and being this moment, I just felt, again, there's a sense of freedom. Like, I'm not there to judge whatever it is that spirit is doing through me. I don't know. I have no freaking idea. Uh, so, and it, it is strange to um, to let go of of, um, of control and and to let go of doing and and to know. You know, I'm supposed to know. So again, thank you. <laughs> and there's tons of miracle in my life every day. It's, it's just, oh, I, 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 and I have no idea where, again, where, where I'm going to be next month, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, we're journeying with you because when you go to a new house and you just practice the trust and the faith and the I don't know, um, how, how beautiful. I, that's what I like about it. I, I remember I was on the road for better, the better part of five years with this, and it's so precious uh, because it's the kind of training that we've been calling for uh, to not have everything so fixed and set and going to seems to be new places. And then the ego says, "What, what are you going to do to help here?" and are you in your function here? And da, 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 da. And you, you can just, no, 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 I don't know. I don't know. You know, it, it's, that is your safety, uh, is uh, not knowing and not knowing the form. So I see you growing stronger in that um, uh, every day. And uh, we're, we're with you. That's, that's so beautiful about these Wednesdays. It seems like it's always Wednesday. It's yeah. like, we're like, it's Wednesday. Oh, and there's Julie. And look, look where she is now. She's in a new a new place, you know, so we're like all, we're taking the journey Wednesday, Wednesday, Julie, Julie, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, you know, we're, we're in the joy with you, so thank you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, I'm going to go to Susan next. Hi, right, Susan. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm coming on because of the theme. You know, I don't want to hold back communicating. So once again, uh, this film was so great. The commentary was great. Thank you so much. The comments from everyone. Um, this was a little emotional for me because I have been on a long unwinding road <laughs> long unwinding road. so I have a lot of songs coming to my mind but I'll spare us um, <laughs> and I read this book in 1980 and I love the book and I read his other book No Ordinary Moments if you saw me on the phone it was like I was looking up the year because I had no idea about time you know what year it was and, and in one of my writings to you a, a short one um, I mentioned I had a teacher, like a seeming teacher that I met in 76, who like, that's why it was so moving for me, because like Socrates, uh, my making a decision then that God was all I wanted, that's what I did, you know, and I was seemingly young, not that I'm seemingly old, doesn't matter, but um, it was emotional because things you've said about your parents, um, you know, I've had family members say, I broke my mother's heart and she died of a heart attack. You know, my father just couldn't believe what I was doing because they saw me as a doctor, as a this, as a that, you know, good Jewish girl from Brooklyn. And I seemed to be following someone who was very much like Socrates and no one could understand except at the end of my mother's life, she was saying the Lord's Prayer. 
Then I can tell you, this Jewish woman, whose name is Lillian, by the way, another mm-hmm. Lil. Yeah. <laughs> and she was saying the Lord's Prayer. So, uh, and this, this teacher I mentioned, he said, it's all the dream, make it a good one. But he also disciplines like crazy, no smoking, no drinking, no sex outside of marriage. I mean, I like, wow. But it, it didn't faze me. Because I, I knew there was truth here that, that God was all I wanted. However, at that time, being so young and being in the light of the light and the light, and that's what people say, oh, you're all about the light. So it took years later, you know, to really begin looking at the darkness and really letting it up. And that probably happened in the teepee, which is why God said, okay, now you still have that darkness. You know, I'm not saying it's not all there, but I got rid of a chunk of it then. So I have no idea. <laughs> but it's, I've been one of you. I'm one of your 40-year journeyers here. And uh, so I have songs coming to me. What was the other one? On the Road to Find Out. You know, just, it's extraordinary. So, and this time I agree with Stephen. I listen, Saturday was amazing. This was amazing. So, I mean, just thank you. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. We feel, we feel your joy. Yeah, that, that Enya song is coming to mind for you. I might, I might be just beginning. I might be near the end. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's it. That's the, there it is. <laughs> thank you. But I was just going to say, uh, by the grace of God, go I. And one thing this, this teacher told me back then is that the kingdom of God is within. And to listen to that guidance. So that's why I was so moved by this man who was saying, mm-hmm. as you do, you know, similar things. So praise God. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, well, that's all the questions, all the hands we have at the moment. Okay, wow. What a great night. <laughs> uh, it's so beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you all for, for joining and coming together on this ride together. We have a lot of fun with these movies, and uh, yeah, that definitely was a ride really taking us all the way into the moment at the very end. You know, what are you this moment? So, so they will stay going along with these Wednesdays. It always seems to be Wednesdays. So we, <laughs> it's a time collapse, I think. <laughs> Is it Wednesday again? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so thank you so much and God bless you and Stay in the holy instant. Stay in the safety and the joy of the holy instant. And we love you.